Hey, what's up guys? It's AK Rex here and I am bringing to you another special. Today I have an interview with the mammoth guy and his name is Dr. Tim King and uh, helping me out today, as usual now on this channel, Joshua will say hello Josh, hello How's Tim, how are you guys doing? <laughs> Hi Arson, hey, it's an honor to be here. Awesome sauce, welcome to the channel, and uh, I know quite a lot of my viewers are into the mammoths, and I think they will very much appreciate what we're about to do here. And uh, uh, of course, uh, before we actually start the main thing, I just wanted to say this is a tradition of the channel, usually do it at the end, but I think this, in case we don't have time, let's quickly remind people, are dinosaurs awesome? Yes or no? Oh, he's asking you, Tim. Are you asking us <laughs> yeah. if dinosaurs are awesome? Yes. Dude, we wouldn't be here if they weren't. <laughs> you know, come on. <laughs> That's duh. It's a well-oiled cool. machine we run here, guys. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a traditional I thought, channel, I thought you were just getting rhetorical or something. It's like, oh, you're serious. Like, what? No, no, this is duh. a serious question. This is a serious question on this channel. Like, oh, yeah. uh, like, everybody who comes to the channel has to acknowledge publicly that dinosaurs are awesome. So now that we've done that, I think <laughs> what we'll do is uh, we will uh, get you, Josh, to start off with this question one, uh, as you laid out, and uh, we will just take turns. And if you're happy, let's proceed. Yeah, no, it sounds good, Tim. Uh, pleasure seeing you again. Um, good to see you, Josh. Yeah, no, it's been uh, too long since we've had our last adventure. Uh, okay. So... It'll be it'll be great to kind of do a little overview of our past adventures. Uh, so one of the quick questions are: uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, how did you get into paleo? And uh, being that I know that uh, the Cashville mammoth was that the the direct line for you to get into paleo, uh, go ahead and feel free to expand on the Cashville mammoth, who discovered okay. it, how it was discovered, all that jazz. <laughs> okay, okay. So the Cashville mammoth. Um, it did make it into some news. I think you can find it online. But it, it, the whole thing just was surreal and hilarious. <laughs> but to back up, I'm not a paleontologist. I'm an archaeologist. But most people, the average person doesn't seem to know the difference. They, I think it's, <laughs> I blame TV and movies, because in TV and movies, they make archaeologists and paleontologists dress the same. And we're both <laughs> digging stuff up. And so the, the bullet point version was at the end of 2010 in the town of Castroville, California, which is near the Bay Area, um, they're the artichoke capital of the world. On a huge family farm, the Jefferson's farm, this huge family farm of hundreds of acres of artichokes, they were leveling out some of the fields and so on, and they hit a mammoth with their plow, so to speak. And so they found a tooth, this giant tooth, and they, they knew enough about livestock and all that that they're like, this is not, what the hell is this? And they looked it up online, and it's like, oh, my God, we hit a mammoth in the middle of our artichoke field. So they contacted the local parks department, and they got a hold of the district archaeologist, um, who, whom I happen to know. And... I found out about it because my sister actually has a, a, um, a farm nearby. And so at the family Christmas party in 2010, a friend of my sister's goes, Hey, Tim, a friend of mine found this in his field, and he shows me a photo on his phone of a mammoth tooth. And I was like, Oh, my God. So have you contacted anybody? And they're like, Oh, yeah, we contacted this guy, Mark. And I'm like, Oh, my God, I know Mark. So very quickly, within a couple of days, I'm on the phone with him. And they're like, Dude, are you going to dig it up? He's like, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, can I, can I help? You know, like, hey, dig up a mammoth. Who would turn that down? Everybody wants to dig up a mammoth, except for people who do it professionally and they get sick of mammoths. But for the average person. <laughs> so what happened was we very quickly within a few days had a small team and we were out there looking at it. And, you know, we're not paleontologists, but we know how to excavate. But we need to get a paleontologist on board. So very quickly, the team formed, and I became one of the four sort of project directors. My job was basically to wrangle people outside the project to work with the project. So I started trying to flush out local paleontologists 
And I got a hold of a few, but most of them kind of confessed. They're like, I'm, I'm kind of a dinosaur guy, and I <laughs> don't want to dig up a mammoth. And so we were kind of flying blind. That is, we know how to excavate, but most of us knew very little about mammoths, but we were trying to learn as quickly as possible. Then the press found out. We were trying to keep it secret. We did for several months because it was private property. We didn't want people coming out there trying to loot or whatever. The press found out, and the next thing you know, I get c contacted by uh, Trevor Valet, who was at the La Brea Tar Pits at that time. And he's like, can I, can I come up and see your mammoth? And we were just like, oh, thank God, a paleontologist. Yes, please. So Trevor wheels in, you know, one weekend as we're working, and out comes Trevor, out comes Josh. And um, they're both kind of a, a spectacle. I got to tell you, Trevor is like covered in tattoos. He had a purple goatee at the time, big ear spools. <laughs> and you wouldn't you wouldn't expect a guy without appearance. You wouldn't. I mean, he looked like a bouncer at a nightclub or something, or like very much at home running a tattoo parlor. But you would never expect that this is like one of the great geniuses of paleontology. And then it was like, oh, thank God he wants to work with us because, you know. And so within minutes of him him arriving, it's like, okay, Trevor, which bone is this? Like we're we're a little confused. I mean, we can tell you about living things, but we're what is this ulna? And so we a lot of we learned very quickly from Trevor. Okay, so um, the Castroville mammoth, in the scheme of things, was not most of it was not extraordinary in the sense that we only recovered about twenty percent of a mammoth, and most of it was not lovely or intact. It it appears that this poor beast, like which is a not uncommon death for a mammoth, is that it was that area was an estuary. And likely the mammoth just got stuck in the mud and its own body weight pushing it into the mud. I mean, this, this is a common issue with modern elephants, for example, um, is they get trapped in mud. And then this thing sank probably quickly enough below the mud with very low oxygen, no sunlight. Um, we're looking at uh, the bones were decollagenated enough that we couldn't get a radiocarbon date on it, but we could get the soil layer underneath it was 26,000 years old. So this thing had just been sitting in sediment for 20, at least probably 26,000 years. The remarkable thing was within a matter of a day or two of excavating, we were getting like bristles coming out of the clay. And everybody was checking like, hey, check your brushes. And it's like, no, this isn't synthetic. We were getting like hair, like something the consistency of horse hair coming out of the clay adjacent to the bones. And that we just thought, what if there's the wild chance that this might be the Colombian mammoth hair? And what we're getting is a, a preservation context where it has very low oxygen, very low sunlight, and that the hair might survive even though the muscle and the flesh didn't. So now we were faced with the prospect that there, we might actually have mammoth hair on the site. So we had to devise this protocol now. Of, and of course, this became one of my jobs on the site, is walking around with surgical gloves and a test tube and tweezers. And about every 15 minutes, someone would shout, hair, and it'd have to run over to the, to the excavation unit. And you know, sure enough, within a matter of a few months, we had a, a test tube filled with about uh, 30 mammoth hairs in varying states of survival, if you will. Um, and of course, there was a lot of false hairs that you would go to an excavation unit and you'd look and it's like, no, that's your hair. Or, no, that's that's a, a synthetic nylon bristle from your brush. And we did have a running joke at the site, too, is that if you got a hair that wasn't mammoth hair, you had to eat it. And some people actually took us up on that. Um, anyway, so... I, as part of my job there, is I reached out to Stefan Schuster at uh, Penn State. He's a paleofaunal geneticist. And, you know, hey, uh, we might have mammoth hair. Do you want to check it out? And um, he was quite excited. And unfortunately, you know, given the small sample size, we had to use a lot of our sample. We gave a lot of our sample to him. And <clears throat> the exciting thing was this, is that he wasn't able to get like, you know, the Colombian mammoth genome out of it or anything like that. It was really degraded. But he was able to tell us um, what DNA we did, what little fragments we did get. It's like, yeah, that's mammoth. 
So that was exciting for us is that, no, we weren't able to, you know, recover a vast amount of the Colombian mammoth genome or anything. But what was exciting is we come to find that the hair we were, the hairs we were finding were Colombian mammoth hairs, which may be the first time ever. And it's kind of exciting for paleontology that it, it might be the message of like, hey, look, when you're digging around in certain situations, keep your eyes peeled because that hair was coming out of 26,000 year old clay. It's very likely from the animal. And, and it ended up being that. So there we, we have a, a mere few surviving hairs left and we're waiting. Um, you know, we're, we're saving those for uh, very specific kinds of data collection and so on. We have to, those are precious. We can't expend anymore. Anyway, um, so the, the Castroville Mammoth Project uh, was a spectacular thing because it was effectively done pro bono. The Jefferson family, it, they were amazing, and the Lyons family, who also had that property, they set aside acres of cropland. I mean, they were growing artichokes, and they basically set aside what, have, what would have been income for them um, for this project because they believed in it. And... They had, uh, they got, you know, we had people donate like fencing and things like that. And it was all the people that worked on it. So it ended up being a project um, of a number of schools around here that we had Foothill College, we had Santa Clara University, San Jose State, UC Santa Cruz, we had Stanford, we had, we had people from UCLA. It became this kind of work of love. And it was really cool to see all these people come together for this project that it would have cost, you know, quarter of a million dollars or something like that and everybody did it because they believed in it and it was amazing and it was at times miserable conditions we had to put a huge tent over it during the rainy season and we're working in mud and um but at the end it was really exciting and we all got to be you know really proud of this of like hey we came together and we dug up a mammoth for 20 percent of a mammoth and so we're still working on the field report and that may take a little more time um so that's how I know Josh Balze also, is that Josh became our site illustrator and was a regular fixture around there. And something that never quite came out in the news is that mammoth didn't die alone. We found fragments of other megafauna. We had uh, yesterday's camel, we had bison, we had ground sloth, Jefferson's ground sloth. Um, it was cool. So that, that, that little spot there was some pocket, some muddy death trap thousands of years ago, but n nothing at the level of like La Brea tar pits. I mean, everything was just fragments of stuff, but it was exciting to find out that something like that could exist under your feet in the small artichoke town of Castroville, California. <laughs> nice. And then uh, you actually, uh, you jumped ahead in uh, one of our other questions, but just to backpedal a little bit, um, the Colombian mammoth, um, the hairs that were recovered, because I know you were the one that was spearheading a lot of that research to recover the DNA. And uh, it was actually mentioned in an article of the Smithsonian back in 2014. And um, yeah, I, I believe... That DNA recovery to date is some of the first DNA recovered from the Colombian mammoth species because the only other Colombian mammoth with hair that I was able to track down was in like Clute, Texas, and that was back in 2004. And they haven't even been able to recover those DNA samples. Um, they were trying to because they had the hair, but they weren't able to recover DNA. Uh, so to date, I believe our Colombian mammoth and Castroville is the only one to have DNA recovered from it. Yeah, but it, but it was incredibly fragmentary. You know, it was just a disaster. So, yeah, you could see that there was once DNA there, and then there were these were just tiny little scraps of it. And um, at least the impression I got is it, it wasn't anything incredibly meaningful or useful, in, but in so much as that he was able to say that, oh, uh, yeah, uh, that's a confirmation. Those hairs came from a mammoth. And a species of mammoth that has never been sequenced before, which is kind of exciting. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. Like, we should never downplay that we got the Colombian mammoth DNA because <laughs> uh -huh. we're the first yeah. one, we're the first ones to do it, baby. It made it well, in the Smithsonian. <laughs> even even if it's just a few fragments 
of you know just a couple of genes or something like that, but it's still kind of cool to be. Well, I think it, I think it has bigger implications for paleontology for the actual work of paleontology. If you're dealing with something like a Colombian mammoth, I, I get the impression a lot of people aren't expecting to find hair and would have just completely overlooked it. I mean, we had a student, I think it was a student, Jason, was the one that pointed out in the first couple of days, he goes, hey, check out this hair. And had he not said that, we could have gone through the entire excavation just basically throwing away data, not even realizing it's data. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty <clears throat> significant because to, to give uh, people out there a context, um, the La Brea Tar Pits, for example, who has one of the largest collectives of Colombian mammoth uh, remains and bones, uh, we don't get that kind of preservation in the in the La Brea Tar Pits. We, we can't extract any kind of, even though the preservation is uh, spectacular, because of the nature of the asphalt pits and the tar, it completely degrades and destroys all organic material into that oil and tar slick. Uh, so to find Colombian DNA in Northern California is huge because it's something that we don't even get here in the tar pits. And I'll have to confess the, <laughs> the, the surviving the surviving samples are indeed in a test tube filled in helium. <clears throat> uh, it's a, that is, <clears throat> excuse me. So I have to I have to confess that we you know we we do have some of the samples left. It's a few hairs. And they are stored in a refrigerated facility in a test tube filled with helium in the salad crisper of my refrigerator. Um, <laughs> that I that that's I'm 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 the keeper of the hair right now. It's only a few hairs left. We had to give most of the really big good ones to Stefan, but but it is in a in a secure facility. It's being maintained, no oxygen environment and <laughs> nice. All righty. Well, I'll defer uh, to Arson. Arson, go ahead and uh, take the next question. Okay. Uh, I, I I was almost saying like, do you guys just want to chill and I'll just wait till the very end and just conclude the session or something? <laughs> 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 in any case, uh, okay. AK Rex back in business. Um. So I've got um, a question here from uh, uh, a friend of ours that is uh, ours and Josh's and one day team maybe if uh, we get a chance you will meet him too it's from jeffrey um uh, whose surname is bond which should be more exciting to meet him because everything with the name bond is exciting so uh in terms of lifestyle that's his question yeah in terms of lifestyle uh would the colombian mammoth have more you know a closer resemblance to the african elephant or indian elephant or is there a third choice in your opinion uh tim um, it, it is the question. Jeffrey's question is about the lifestyle. That is its behavior or its appearance. I'm not quite clear. Uh, lifestyle as in probably behavior, because I I don't think that appearance was here taken account for. But uh, if you feel like you can address both, why not? Well, you'd have to consider. Okay, uh, Castroville going back, you know, twenty six thousand years. It wasn't much different than it is now. It was. A little bit warmer and perhaps more humid so it was a giant lush green estuary it's probably the reason that the mammoth died there is it was drawn to this area of confluence of fresh water and and uh, greenery but then there's always the hazard of all that soft mud that that's not the lifestyle of African or or uh, Asian elephants that it, it's it's in a different ecosystem um, I mean, we even have to remember that a Colombian mammoths were huge. They were among some of the largest of the mammoths. They really they, they outsize an African elephant by quite a bit. As far as lifestyle, we can only take guesses. You know, that is, the we see the behaviors, the common behaviors of the surviving members of this you know group here, is that they are social. And so we don't have reason to believe that something like a Colombian mammoth wouldn't wouldn't be, you know. So we're, we're suspecting that, again, and this is based on supposition, it's based on what, what we know about living relatives, is that they were probably quite social. They spent a lot of time grazing, you know, a lot of eating grasses and so on. And something to add, by the way, with the Colombian mammoth is the average person, when they hear mammoth, they only think of woolly mammoth. Most, a lot of people don't know there are other mammoths. And... I think there's an assumption that people want to portray a Colombian mammoth kind of maybe woolly mammoth-like, 
there's a very good chance it didn't have a lot of hair. It may have had some body hair like, like you know, a modern elephant's. Um, but it, it wouldn't have needed it. It was actually living in a pretty cushy environment where it doesn't need hair. Um, so the hairs we did find, interestingly enough, they they have more of the appearance of a guard hair that you would find on a woolly mammoth. They, they, yeah. they were kind of long and coarse. Um, we didn't find incredibly long ones. I think the longest hair we found was maybe about five inches. But they they were not as thick as the thickest woolly mammoth hair. But they're kind of like a horse hair. They're kind of like a guard hair as opposed to an undercoat that the ma the woolly mammoths have. The woolly mammoths have that that fuzzy fleece like undercoat. We didn't recover anything that looked like that, to my recollection. So we're looking at something that may have had the skin coloration of modern elephants and had hair. Because modern elephants do actually have hair, also. Just you just don't see a lot of it. And th this thing was. Again, larger, eating a lot more, but it's also probably larger because it's living in an environment where the grocery store is limitless. So it can afford to be large. And, and you have to imagine, too, that being large sometimes evolutionarily is a defense that if you can afford to eat and feed a huge body, it makes it that much harder for predators to take you down if you're five times the size of your predator. So uh, basically, uh, I, from what I understand, is uh, that... <coughs> What we like to use in this case is the so-called extant phylogenetic bracketing to model the closest relatives alive today in order to be able to uh, predict, perhaps. It doesn't mean it's always correct, but because, you know, new evidence comes up and it always either proves or disproves certain ideas and hypotheses, but it is a defensible enough hypothesis to suggest that uh, Colombian mammoth could have perhaps uh, incorporated... Uh, Obviously, some of its own traits, unique to its own species, and some of the traits that are both present in both the Asian and the African element. Uh, is that something that you would agree with mostly or disagree with mostly, Tim? I would say when it comes to behavior, because, I mean, there are some things we could use to reconstruct behavior. If we find, you know, a mass grave or we can find, you know... Uh, in ecofact, we can find some sort of fossilized footprints where we see that they're walking in groups. But beyond that, um, a lot of the behavioral things are just, they're lost. We, we can't reconstruct them. And so that's why often scientists will rely upon, well, we could take some guesses based on the closest relatives by bracketing. And, you know, and, and that's the thing is that mammoths are sandwiched pretty much in between Asian elephants and African elephants. So, um, and again, so when we offer things like that, it's not as a statement of fact. It is clearly framed as this is what we suspect, but we, we don't really know. <clears throat> and and I would I would note though that there there are still different camps out there as far as classification because you know we have the, some groups are still holding on to Mammuthus imperator as a as a Colombian mammoth, but it's a different species and and really from what I know is that it is they're they're nearly identical in in all things except the fact that the imperators are just huge. And but at the same time we see this at La Brea Tar Pits. We see this this large male Zed. It's just enormous. I mean his I got to see his skull with the asphalt still oozing out of it. It's it's immense. I I, I don't uh, to my recollection I don't think we have that much morphological variation among individuals among elephants that I mean we you can get the exceptional like really large male African elephant for example that you can get some size variation and a lot of its sexual dimorphism but in the case of Imperator it may be more than that we may have these super females and super males that are um, through perhaps even epigenetic reasons that they they become the leader of the group and they end up, I don't know, getting huger doses of growth hormone and stuff like that in their system where they just become immense individuals based upon actual social position. That, that's, it's a possibility. I'm throwing this out here as, as floating it more as a hypothesis that somebody <laughs> we might be able to figure out someday. But I, I'm among the group that, that suspect that really the Imperators are simply Colombian mammoths and we're looking – that they have a greater morphological variation than the than living elephants. That's all, and it, it doesn't seem unreasonable because 
uh, when you look at Imperator, it really it's pretty much the same as a Colombian man. It's just a really damn big one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's really interesting. I mean, uh, I just wanted to, before I pass the microphone over to Josh for the next question, just wanted to comment that me and Josh, when we had our first session on the channel, we briefly discussed the specimen Z, and I cannot wait to go to LA. That's basically the Labriette Arpitz Museum, right? Where the specimen Z is currently located in that collection. So I really want to go and meet Zed in person one of these days. It must be, like, I've seen the pictures and I've seen Josh next to the specimen and uh, knowing that Josh is a pretty big guy himself, I would say, that mammoth dwarfs Josh. So, yeah, I really want to see this specimen. It, it, will, it will blow your mind. It's a pretty spectacular experience. And likewise, too, if you've had the chance to go to the St. Petersburg Museum, the Biological Zoological Museum, They've got a steppe mammoth. They have a lot of the famous mammoths in that museum. And if you're a fan of mammoths, go there. It is the mecca. They've got, you know, they have the, the was it the Adams mammoth, the first mammoth ever reconstructed and put on display. And they have Masha and Dima. They have a steppe mammoth. And that moved me when I saw it because that the steppe mammoth that they have is enormous. It is like 20 feet high. It is just the biggest damn thing you've seen. You, when you look at that, you realize, wow, I had no idea how huge these animals could get. Can I ask, just sorry, Josh, to be postponing because he, you brought up a steppe mammoth here as well. And I wanted to know uh, just quickly to differentiate. Steppe mammoth is a different species. And are they bigger than Colombian mammoths or are they kind of in the same size sort of league plus minus? Um. As far as what, what I've seen, but it's been a limited set of samples, is that the steppe mammoths, I think, were larger than Colombian mammoths, but then you could get those exceptional Colombian imperators like Zed that probably were neck and neck with a steppe mammoth. But again, it's the, it's the example of the St. Petersburg, Petersburg Museum, it, it may be the largest mammoth found. I mean, the thing is immense. It is again. I, if I gotta guess, it's got to be about twenty feet high. It's like two stories high. It's you could probably <laughs> fit inside its skull. It's really terrifyingly large. And if you fall off, you could break some bones as well of your own. If you fall off that thing, if you ever oh, decide yeah. for whatever stupid reason, if you ever decide to climb it without any safety precautions, <laughs> but uh, you try to imagine predators trying to tra take down something yeah. that size, and it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, you get these, you know saber tooth cats and things like that and it's really funny because when you have something that size it's like it would be kind of ridiculous to watch predators attempt to take down that thing it's like it's like a piece of construction machinery it's that enormous awesome awesome i need to check out that collection once i get my feet in st petersburg because i just love this kind of stuff so and that will make a, an excellent material for the channel too now, um, uh, I suppose now I can pass on uh, the microphone to Josh, and uh, that counts to question five, unless it's been uh, glided in any case. But anyway, Josh, you feel free to take over. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, now just to backtrack on a couple of things, though, uh, because, you know, paleo guy over here has got to talk about some stuff. But um, just, to, just to differentiate, um, as it stands... Um, with the current abstracts and research, there there is no imperial mammoth. There is only the Colombian mammoth. Uh, so Tim is correct in his um, his um, his dividing of the two species in terms of like the way we look at it is the breed that is of Colombian mammoth that's in the Liberia tar pits. That was the breed that was proposed as the imperial mammoth. But after a lot of research and papers, they did not find enough differences to kind of justify uh, a different species or subspecies. So it's now considered a different breed of mammoth. But yeah, I mean, Tim has seen the, the, the trophy size Colombian mammoth that we have on display. And that was the species that they kind of proposed originally as imperial mammoth. And then uh, in terms of Zed, Zed is actually noted to be 20% larger than the that trophy species that we have on display uh, so all of zed's elements which tim has also seen in person they're they're all 20 percent bigger than any known colombian mammoth species uh, to date 
So we're talking about a mammoth that's been found that's 20% larger than any of its known kin. Um, in terms of the steppe mammoth, um, I'll defer to Tim because I haven't seen that specimen in, in, in person. Uh, but it looked huge. <laughs> and um, when Tim shows you the photos, it's a huge animal. Um, but in terms of um, uh, officially, uh, again, it's hard to tell because a lot of science hasn't been shared across the board. Um, but officially, in the abstracts and the papers, uh, the Columbian species and the steppe mammoth species are about toe-to-toe -to -toe around the, the larger of the mammoth species. Um, and the only way we can solve this is with um, sharing the scientific data. So we need to get Western science into St. Petersburg, and we need to get St. Petersburg science into La Brea Tar Pit, so that way we can start sharing the data. Uh, but yeah, that's ju that's just to do a rundown of like all the data that we just shared. So I, yeah, that way people can start looking up the correct data that are listening to this interview. So yeah, <laughs> just to just to do some paleo mammoth droppage of facts and nonsense right there. And you know, Josh Josh made an interesting point. And in, um, my experience a few years ago uh, got to spend some time hanging out with some of the Russian scholars and. They're all open about sharing information and data. I mean, we're not always working with the same species, of course, but they were just as excited about Colombian mammoths as Trevor and I were about woolly mammoths and steppe mammoths. And and um, I think reaching out to these guys and getting more information wouldn't be difficult. I think it would just be willing to do it, needing to do it. Just somebody needs to reach out. And that is, there is a community of lunatics like us <laughs> around the globe and um especially in in russia and in the united states of bridging that gap between the lunatics and there there are people doing that i mean that is there are scholars who who straddle both continents so to speak but i i think certainly uh, my experience with the russian scholars is is they'd welcome more they'd love it we had a we had a blast hanging out with Simeon Grigoriev. He's a really nice guy, and uh, Alexei Tikhonov, and, and you know, um, so yeah, it would be interesting. But of course, you know, whoever you ask, they're going to say that their mammoth is the largest, and we're going to have to actually <laughs> just measure them, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's going to come down to measuring each other's mammoth. I, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, all righty. Uh, moving on to question five. Um, so, we're getting into the meat of the uh, of this uh, of this interview. Uh, now that we know the uh, your paleo background and how we met in our history in mammoth. Uh, so, question five is: How excited were you to be approached for a mammoth special with National Geographic? Um, it's it, it seems surreal, and it it. It has a kind of a funny, I'll give you the funny brief story behind it is, um, so with the Castroville Mammoth Project is, I had done a few uh, local news bits about it. They wanted to interview somebody and I, I don't know, I gave good sound bites or something. And so I, I didn't know this, but a lot of them ended up on YouTube. So in 2013, a few years later, I just got this random phone call from London from a production company saying, look, a mammoth has been found in Siberia, and would you be interested in going there and trying to find out and track it down and check it out? And again, there comes the thing of wanting to explain the difference between archaeology and paleontology. But when someone says, hey, you want to go to Siberia and look at a frozen mammoth with National Geographic, I just kind of rolled with it. <laughs> I just, <laughs> uh, and, yeah, I'm an archaeologist. Yeah, and you've looked at mammoths. Yeah, I'm an archaeologist that's looked at mammoths. Sure, I'll look at your. I'd love to, you know. And but 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 mind you, also it had already been a couple of years of working with Josh Balze and with Trevor, and I learned a lot from you guys. I mean, you guys. I'd say that I was your officially. I could claim to be your protege. Um, when it comes to these matters, I still wouldn't consider myself an authority. I would just consider myself a dude who's managed to work with two different amazing mammoths and I, that's it. Um, so they approached me and they said, well, if you could go with somebody else, who would you bring? And I was like, well, without, you know, skipping a beat there is, well, Trevor Valley. I mean, he's a great paleontologist and he's a real character and he, he would be 
he'd be he'd be a fun fun character on the show and then there was just kind of silence i didn't hear anything back and i heard well trevor's on board and i heard crickets it was like for months i had no idea what's going on i didn't think it was going to happen and then in like the end of july months had passed i get a phone call hey tim so you ready to go to siberia like wait that's still happening yeah yeah um well when um in a week <laughs> Like, wait, 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 wait. I don't have a visa. I, um, I've got a parka, but I don't, oh, geez. <laughs> you know, so it's just sort of like, I, I, it was kind of exciting, and then it just became anticlimactic because I didn't hear any, I didn't know it was still on. And then about a week before, it's like, oh, so are you up for it? And I'm like, oh, crap. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, I, can you get me a visa? Yeah, we'll work on it. <laughs> and so within a week, I was just within a week, I'm now in London and about to go out to Siberia to 300 miles above the Arctic Circle eventually. And it was, um, yeah, uh, we were there for the month of summer. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, no, I remember, uh, I remember when um, we were doing phone calls and you would just, you, it was exactly like, like that. You, you called me about this National Geographic thing. I was like, oh, that sounds great. I hope it happens. And then, like you said, just months of silence. <laughs> and then yeah. um, and then finally I get this, like, random text of, like, oh, hey, FYI, I'm going to Siberia. And I was like, oh, well, cool, man. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah that it just... sounds... Yeah, that, that, it sounds like a it sounds like a typical Hollywood production where it's like we're going to tell you about it, we're not going to tell you anything, and then a week from production yeah. we're going to let you know if you're ready. <laughs> well, yeah, and that was kind of the thing and part of it was like this this was kind of a secret operation that they didn't know where the mammoth was. They had a, maybe an idea, but we we had to go there. Part of what Trevor and I had to do is we had to kind of go there and figure out who had it and where the hell is it. And can and by the way, would you be willing to let two Californian scientists come look at it? With, you know, sight unseen. Um, so uh, th I, I guess they had a lot of faith in us that we'd pull it off. We actually did, and and there wasn't much resistance either. It was a matter of once we found the right people, they're like, yeah, sure, cool, hey, welcome. You know, it's like <laughs> again, they they were totally welcome to share and cooperate, which is really the spirit of science too. And we're we're really in indebted to them that they were so generous and um but it it was kind of a pain in the neck finding out where it was who had it and and how to get there <laughs> all righty so yeah that's uh that's my question uh back to you arson yeah that sounds really interesting and thank you very much for passing the mic josh and uh now i think it's time to jump into the next one so uh, without uh, breaking your NDA and uh, like you know the deal memo with the studio, so what would be the craziest experience you had while filming on location in Siberia that you are allowed to share? Yeah, um, well, I I'll give you this much: all the really crazy stuff was it's not you know, like NDA kind of stuff. I'm not revealing. You know, I don't know. Um, there, that's. Um, the craziest stuff of working in Siberia. So uh, I'll tell you this much: every day was crazy stuff, um, <laughs> and but but hilarious. I mean, some of it was really hilarious, and some of it was like, "Wow, we just did something really dangerous and stupid." Um, and that wasn't the goal of the show either. The goal wasn't like, "Hey, let's go out in the middle of nowhere and be reckless and and, and do dumb stuff and endanger ourselves." It, it didn't happen like that. Um, well, it did happen like that, but that wasn't the, the <laughs> point, you know, the point is go find the mammoth and check it out. And if you can, and if you can't, I don't know what we're going to do with the show, but you know, okay. So, um, we did things like, uh, I'll tell you a few things that are funny. Okay. So if you get a chance to see the show, Mammoth Unearthed by National Geographic came out, I don't know, in 2014. I already um, have actually. You, you've seen it. Yeah, yeah, I watched it yesterday, actually, yeah. Oh, okay. So there's a point where I'm at a site on the Yana River called Muskaya, which means frozen mountain. And it is a permafrost cliffside facing the river, and it appears that every summer as things thaw out, the cliffside melts away a little bit more. Well, there are all these tunnels of meltwater that kind of canal out. So there's this entire like tunnel system 
Not to mention that there are uh, tusk hunters, that is local guys that go there with water pumps and blast away at the cliffside looking for ivory to sell on the market. So I'm in one of these tunnels, and of course, it hadn't occurred to us, for example, that batteries, when they get cold, don't work. So I'm in the damn tunnel, and my lights start going out. And it was it was not cool. And <laughs> the thing is, my caving suit is not like totally watertight. So um, you can see in the show, by the time I got out of there, I, I just couldn't feel my legs and my hands anymore. Okay, that alone was dumb and dangerous. That was like, yeah, that was kind of stupid, but also super cool because I could see there's just bones and stuff coming out of the frozen permafrost. Like you just crawling through this tunnel and it's like just stuff is you know woolly rhino hair coming out of the walls and that's spectacular you know and i'm the first person to see it it's like the first time i've seen daylight in twenty seven thousand years well <laughs> we come to find out that that tunnel collapsed the entrance to that tunnel collapsed about 12 hours after we were in there Jeez. and that that was that was kind of a sobering moment where uh, talked to one of the the people that was camped out there, and it was like, oh, the tunnel you're in, it's gone now. <laughs> it was like, Jeez. oh wow. <laughs> well, it's the entrance in particular. The entrance is where things are melting, and it's soft. Deeper in, it is well below cold. It is painfully cold in there. But that was stupid. Um, I mean, I'm <laughs> glad I did it, but I really wouldn't get in the practice doing it again, knowing that those tunnels can, you know, collapse. Um, uh, there's just funny stuff. I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. So I'll tell you about Tusik the dog. When we were in the town of Kazachie, which was the sort of final destination, where we come to find that that was where the mammoth had been secretly stored. Um, we were finally staying in a house. We, we actually, there's some local guy that was willing to sort of rent out his house. And he moved in with the in-laws or something. So we had a base camp that was indoors, which was super exciting. Because we had been living outdoors hadn't bathed in weeks. That's the other thing to keep in mind. We were filming <laughs> for over a month. Take a look at how many different sets of clothes I'm wearing. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Two. And any, you know, there weren't a lot of bathing opportunities. And so, yeah, we all kind of stunk by the end of the trip. Well, there was Tusik the dog, and he came with the house. He belonged to the house, and he Kind of imagine sort of a generic, uh, sort of fuzzy German Shepherdy looking dog, very friendly. And I think I may have been one of the only human beings that actually fed him or fed him things that were delicious. You know, like we'd have some leftovers and I'd save a little bit of some, like reindeer or something and I'd go out and feed it to Tusik. So we immediately became super best friends. And when we're thawing out the Lyakovsky mammoth, he was there at my side. Like there's a, as I'm thawing out the trunk. And picking the frozen, the, as we're thawing it out with water, and then picking out what was frozen mud out of the hair, just particle by particle. Tusik is just sitting there right next to me, keeping me company. We've just decided to be best friends. Well, there was a moment when Trevor was on camera, and I was not, and I was just watching, but I was mic'd up, so I just keep quiet. And nobody noticed Tusik sneaking over to the to the carcass, to the Lyakovsky mammoth, <laughs> and taking a small bite out of some loose flesh and running off with it. <laughs> and I, what do you do? And I, I didn't want to interrupt. So I just got out my phone and took photos of <laughs> Tusik the dog eating 42,000-year-old chunk of mammoth funk. And, you know, it is one of those that... What do you do? It would have been great if it was on camera. And it, and it wasn't like we were all that sloppy on the site or something. It's just that, I don't know, the damn dog snuck in and took a bite. <laughs> and and by the way, he ended up being he wasn't the only dog that tried to run off with some of the mammoth meat. Um, but an interesting thing, a per perhaps unsettling thing, is that we, you know we had heard that there was a mammoth found um, in Siberia years ago called Chroma that was, I believe, a baby. And Chroma had been found to contain anthrax. And can you imagine, not just anthrax, but probably some really scary horror movie Ice Age anthrax that we'd have no cure for or something, right? And there was debate about what to do about this great bio, potential biohazard. And again, I only know this anecdotally, all right? I only know this 
being told this through different uh, folks up there, okay? Apparently, the solution was to put chroma into a nuclear reactor and just irradiate the hell out of it till nothing living was on it. But that was a warning to us. It was something to keep in mind is that we're thawing out a mammoth. We all had emergency rations of Cipro. Like, we all had Cipro, a good spectrum antibiotic. And it was good to have that around, you know, in the event of like, hey, we're thawing out a mammoth. Lord knows what what the meat might be containing. And is anybody here who's part of thawing it out thinking about this? We, we you know, as we're thawing it out, we weren't taking great, you know, CDC spacesuit measures to. But at the same time, it's like, well, be mindful. Don't get any of that in your mouth. <laughs> Wash your hands thoroughly before you eat. Um, and, you know, of course, and so with Tusik the dog, well, Tusik, I guess, volunteered to be our canary in the coal mine. So for the next couple of days, I was watching Tusik closely because if Tusik <laughs> gets sick, we're in, da- we're in danger. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I guess that, well, takes care of that question. Um, uh... Josh, uh, your question seven is up now. So, are you uh, happy with uh, doing this one? Or uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, I, I think we don't have to ask permission going forward with the questions. I think we should be good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. <laughs> <laughs> just fire away. Just yeah, fire away. Um, I mean. Really fast. I'm just I'm, I'm just picturing you, Tim, with the irradiated anthrax mammoth. It's it's like that scene out of uh, out of uh, the Rock where you have Nicolas Cage with the the hypodermic needle chucking it <laughs> in his <the> arms <laughs> after finding the irradiated anthrax strain of mammoth. You know, it's... yeah, you're just like, oh my god, Tusik is dead. Everybody, <laughs> Cipro now. <laughs> yeah, but no, Tusik was just fine. That dog, uh, dog was resilient. That dog ate anything. <laughs> Including oh, mammoths, <laughs> you know. I love that. It's like, well, I know of at least one. Actually, I know of two dogs that uh, actually um, ate mammoth. <laughs> uh, that's just gnarly. <laughs> so, all righty. Um, uh, moving on. Um, I remember watching the show recently, and there's there's a shot where you're just casually squatting next to uh, some like really really great preserved mammoth fur and it's just sticking out of the slope i think it's out of the permafrost hill and um and it puts our casherville mammoth to shame in, in in terms of like sheer quantity of hair that was coming out of that hill um how, how common was it to run into that kind of preservation like day to day in those fields um at the site of muskaya well uh, again the sort of permafrost cliffside that is melting away as the river right next to it thaws out and the month of summer arrives. Um, it, it was astounding how much hair is just everywhere. I mean, you, you could, you'd find a lens of hair coming out of the ice that was big enough to make a wig, you know, like a, a lot of hair there, like a, a whole big foot full of hair. Um, <laughs> He, and, and it was, it wasn't just, it wasn't just mammoth. It was bison also and things like that. Um, an interesting thing, though, it, it's something that it didn't make it into the show, into the final edit. Um, it's, a, it's a question that nobody, I would think, would think to ask. But the answer is astounding. And the question is, what do mammoths, what do woolly mammoths smell like? And I can tell you, because <laughs> I can tell you, because we got to smell more than one. And it was amazing. You could tell when a lens when a lens of hair or a clump of mammoth hair is coming out of the ice because you could smell it before it came out. And it smells like like the kind of cow manure circus animal smell. Like there's a certain smell in common with like horses and cattle. And it's not like I go around a farm sniffing animals or something, but there's a very distinctive smell when you're around cattle and other herbivores. And it's that kind of grassy, musky smell you could tell, you could smell mammoth. You could smell the mammoth hair. And the bones, a lot of the bones that were coming out of the ice, weren't they weren't fossilized. They still had organic matter. They still had fat and grease on them, effectively. And they all stunk the same way. They all reeked. Like this, this sort of, again, cattle, horse, circus animal, kind of musky herbivore smell. 
And uh, you got to imagine like a, a herd of mammoths, uh, you know, eons ago, a herd of mammoths walking across the tundra. You you would have been able to smell them coming. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I, I imagine. I imagine we, we, we have these early hunters. We have us out there going after mammoth. I have no doubt that smelling them on the wind was one of the ways that we were tracking them because they, they, they do stink. And when we were thawing out the Lyakovsky mammoth, all of the frozen, like the permafrost mud that was frozen around it as we were thawing it out, all that mud just stunk too. And <laughs> mind you, we're working with it. So I, it, it got to a point where eventually the smell became nearly permanent on us. That as we're working with the mammoth, you couldn't get rid of the smell. It was in our clothes. It was, and you know, it, we, we just stunk. And we weren't in a, there, there wasn't a way to do laundry and we were too busy. And so there was this one sad moment where we are on a plane to a, a city now and we've been wearing the same clothes that the, the two changes of clothes we had and the, the same clothes that we were thawing out the mammoth with. And as the cabin starts to warm up, then you can really start to smell us. And we realized <laughs> that we were stinking up the entire fuselage. Like I felt bad for everybody else on the plane. It wasn't a very big plane, but I felt really guilty and bad because the entire fuselage of the plane smelled like a circus. It smelled like, like cattle. And, and, you know, and you, I can't imagine the people on the plane knew what the smell was. And you kind of want to turn around and go, I'm really sorry. It's mammoth. You know, we, <laughs> we stunk up your airplane with mammoth. We're really sorry. Maybe you should be honored. You're some of the few people in the last 11 and a half thousand years to know what the smell is. Not that it will ever come in handy to know that. But, um, but yeah, it was a remarkable thing. And even at St. Petersburg in the, the Zoological Museum, the Natural History Museum, we were in the basement in the Mammoth Bone Archive, which was amazing. I mean, there had been specimens that had been in there for, I don't know, over a century, I think. And most of them, again, aren't fossilized. They're ones that were pulled out of permafrost and are still have organic material preserved. There's like chunks of like what look like beef jerky coming off of them. And the room, it's the same smell. It was the familiar smell of, this is the smell of mammoth. All these bones just reek of mammoth. And it was kind of <laughs> cool. And it was kind of cool, and it was something that I was, you know, I, I, I hope that things like that had, will come out more in, in shows about these things, because it, it's, again, it's something no one would ever think to ask, but it's, like, really cool to know that, like, oh, wow, it smells like, you know, modern herbivore, grassy, musky stink. And, yes, it took about three washings for my clothes to stop <laughs> stinking like that, by the way, too. I mean, it just didn't go. It was just awful. It did, but anyway. <laughs> so full full disclosure what's the what was the detergent of choice to get rid of the mammoth funk <laughs> holy water and a priest <laughs> was, uh, some voodoo some voodoo rituals were required there was the thought of just burning them but you know uh, who knows <laughs> nice awesome <laughs> all right back to you Arts. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Josh, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, answering. It was a really interesting uh, thing there, Tim. And uh, let's uh, get into the next question. So, uh, uh, what was the feeling or emotion that you felt when you first stepped into the cave and uh, met up with the show's flagship, that is the Lichowski Mammoth? Um, it started kind of anticlimactic. Is I think if you see in the show, you just see this mass of frozen ice in this weird shape. You know, we were expecting something like out of a cartoon where it's this block of ice with a mammoth, dark mammoth shaped thing in the middle of the ice. And it wasn't like that. It was just sort of this mass of frozen stuff with a few bones sticking out. And it took, it took a few moments for, for Trevor and I to get oriented of what exactly we were seeing. But the nice thing is it was literally there were a few bones sticking out and once we could identify those bones it's like oh this is the front leg here this is the back leg oh okay we're missing the whole top of the neck ah okay so this is what's going on and that's why you saw in in the show is that i i requested to go in in that spend some time in that cave drawing it so we could actually get a sense of what we're looking at before we even thaw it out and um, oh, and by the way, that cave is really damn cold. It's not just freezing; it is well below freezing. It was painful to be in there for <laughs> more than about a half hour. You just lose feeling and everything. It was awful. Oh my goodness! So, yeah. 
Okay, so to answer your question, it was it was exciting, but it wasn't like it was revealed yet. It's like oh, it it was a relief of I got to tell you this much. It was a relief of like oh, thank God we finally found the damn mammoth. Okay, we're here. Okay, major <laughs> issue solved already. We actually succeeded in getting to this mammoth and getting there before it was time to thaw it out because we were just there like a day before all these other research teams had descended for the great day of thawing. So we, we actually made it to the party on time with a little time to spare. In fact, we technically get, Trevor and I get the credit of being the first two Western scientists to see this mammoth because we got there a day earlier and got to look at it. And so it was kind of, that was kind of cool. Awesome stuff. Awesome. And uh, I like that uh, little detail there as well, that you actually were indeed the first uh, uh, guys from the West, uh, you know, to actually be able to take a closer look at it, because all of this stuff is mostly getting talked about. It's probably more really to do with books and maybe media, but it's not a lot of people who actually go there and get a proper hands-on, uh, you know, inspection or look at the specimen. So well done on that part. And... Um, I think I can pass off the mic to Josh. Josh? <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So the next question I have is um, when we saw the special, um, we, we both know the pre-production process with a lot of these specials that happen for Discovery Channel and National Geographic. Um, one of the things they highlighted was the sample taking when the other teams came on site uh, for the Liakovsky Mammoth. Uh, we, we saw shots of them like taking pickaxes and hacking away at the specimen. Um, and there was a, there, there was a moment where you guys had to corral everybody and be like, okay, let's, let's do this a little bit more professionally. Um, my, my question was like, how real to life was this concerning the way the mammoth was treated uh, in terms of like the handling of the specimen and, and how the sample taking was going on with the other, with the other teams? Well, <clears throat> well uh, uh the thing that happened is that we had multiple teams and then we also had people who were, were not like the researchers. They were just sort of like support, if you will. Um, for some unknown reason, other than I don't know, someone who wasn't part of the research teams, as for example, as things were thawing out, they got the trunk and cut the tip off the nose, so to speak, with a sharp knife just I think it was just they just wanted to see if the meat is still pink or something. So sadly now, if you look at images of the Liakovsky mammoth, you'll see it with the tip of its trunk cut off. It's still there. It's just that for no good reason, the guy just cut it off just to see what the tissue was like. And it's like, dude, of all things, did you have to do it with that? This is the most intact mammoth trunk ever found. And did you have to cut the tip off of it? So when we were when we were uh, working on it and stuff, and it was time to take photographs, I just stuck the tip back on because I was just like, "This is the crime. This is the uh, one opportunity to have this thing intact, and it's already got the tip of the nose had been cut loose." So I just stuck it back on. But the thing is, so SOAM Institute, I believe it's it's the Korean Genetics Lab. They had, uh, to my understanding, paid a large sum of money for rights to mammoth meat that they were entitled to a certain number of kilos of samples for their endeavors to you know sequence the genome clone the mammoth that they're claiming that they're going to clone um but one of the things that was kind of unsettling is the thing hadn't even been thought out yet and there were already just samples cubes of meat being cut out from it and it was kind of like i can understand that they they, they want the samples to not be thought out enough that they might start going bad. They want the samples to be fresh. But it was also kind of like, for, I don't know, respect of the mammoth and just for posterity, it's like, could we just thaw it out and take some photographs before you start hacking it up? And, you know, and that was the thing, is unfortunately, like the trunk, there was the underside that we didn't photograph because they'd already taken chunks out of it, you know, like everybody looked the other way and it's like, what the hell, had, you guys already cut meat out of this. But apparently that was the arrangement that they had made, and so be it. But it was it was also kind of a little uh, felt like kind of a shame because this nothing like this has ever been found. The meat was still pink, you know. This is this is a forty two thousand year old specimen where you could still see the muscle fibers. It was it was and it, just to have that happen was kind of uh, unsettling. Um, the a couple of things when the the, the thawing out. 
So Trevor and I had lugged around this several thousand dollar microscope um, in the event that we may actually need it. And, and we put it to use. We actually had our own mobile laboratory. As we borrowed a van and we had our, our microscope set up in there and we had a, um, and it was, it was kind of cool. And we, um, we also had like a fiber optics scope, medical scope. And one of the funny things that was happening is as the mammoth was thawing out, there was debate among the different parties there of whether or not we're looking at a male or a female. Because <laughs> Uh, you look at the the tusks were relatively large, and at the same time, um, this mammoth is not a really huge mammoth. I mean, this mammoth, if I had to guess, she probably was standing less than six foot tall at, at full height. You know, she wasn't that large. Um, and so it's, well, it's male, it's female. And the other thing to confound this is that the farther north you go, the woolly mammoths tend to get smaller. And one way to view this biologically, evolutionarily, is it may be something akin to island dwarfism. That we know that on islands, uh, warm-blooded animals tend to become small. They be, tend to become, in fact, they're even dwarf mammoths that were on, uh, you know, islands, Wrangell Island and the Channel Islands off California. Well, you don't need to have an island to have an environment that functions like that. On an island, uh, the grocery store is relatively small. So if you're a predator, you can't afford to eat all the other things on the island. You'll starve to death. There's an advantage to needing less food when you're in a limited environment like an island. Well, the same can happen in areas like that far north where you basically have these sort of um, refugia that you have a lot of just ice and tundra. But then every so often you have these pockets of mammoth steppe and taiga. And so it could function the same way, is that you have these relatively small kind of ecosystems um, separated by sort of deserts of ice. And it would have the same kind of function as, as you would with an island and an ocean. So there was debate among the scholars of like, well, is this simply a small rep male that might be representative of the area? Is it female? And finally, Trevor and I just look at each other because everybody is just debating. And it was like, hey, Trevor, you got the fiber optic scope yet? Okay, well, let's just go look at the underside. And we just flip the camera underneath it, and Trevor starts giggling. He goes, I see a nipple. <laughs> it's like, all right, problem mystery solved. Because <laughs> everybody's like, oh, it's male, it's female. And it's like, why don't we just check under the hood, guys? And sure enough, we saw the first, as far as I know, the first mammoth breasts ever seen. And <laughs> so Trevor found, because mammoths have breasts basically sort of uh, tucked by their back legs, if you will, that is un on the underside near their back legs, not like humans do. So... Um, and voila, saw a mammoth nipple. So we okay, it's a female, and we've we've since come to learn that the, this is a female. She was in her uh, early fifties, and appeared to have had a number of calves. Uh, that is offspring, which is kind of cool. Um, the thing is, they so we referred to it as the Lyakovsky mammoth. Speaking with like Semyon Grigoryev, I was like, so what do you want to call it? And there was sort of the toying with the idea of calling it Yana, because. We're at the Yana River, and it's a woman's name, and it seems appropriate. It's a dignified name. Well, I haven't heard the verdict yet, and I was looking around like, well, what the? It's got to be Yana, right? The best I've gotten is that they're calling it Buttercup. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I, I kind of have a problem with that because, you know, it's like, look, this is this is a, a, a unique specimen, if you will. It is the first adult female mammoth ever found. In the most intact mammoth ever found. In Buttercup? It's like, did someone let their six-year-old name it? Was this a contest at a local elementary school? And like, someone gets to pick the name? I, just Buttercup just is not dignified. And I, I, I'm pushing for Yana. I'm still going to refer to her as Yana, even if I'm the only person doing it anymore, damn it. <laughs> Yana is a good name. Yeah, no, I think um, I think when we talk about this mammoth, we both... Uh... We we both still call it Yana because we've been talking about this mammoth for what seems like forever. Um, so yeah, we're we're both on the same ship in terms of calling it Yana versus versus Princess Buttercup. Um, I want to say um, to to go back to the original uh, question itself though. So it, it it is interesting to note that yeah the this uh, team of geneticists when they got on site were just hacking away. Um, chunks of flesh out of the specimen. Like you said, it was one of the most intact female specimens that we've had to date. And um, and then I even saw this same specimen recently 
because my question was whatever happened to the specimen and then sure enough there was another special that came on i think it was the travel channel and um it, it was uh, on the show expedition unknown and sure enough the mammoth they had was yana and the way i was able to identify the mammoth was when the host held up the trunk sure enough the tip of the trunk was cut off just as you described it and along the sides of the trunk were cube-like holes of, of just random samples that were taken out of the trunk. So, I mean, that's why it kind of breaks my heart. Like, you know, the, this strange endeavor of cloning a mammoth, it, it's coming at the expense of these, like, almost priceless and irreplaceable uh, specimens uh, that we're finding, you know, survive tens of thousands of years only to end up being chopped up and you know, sampled for DNA purposes well, or something. I, I'd like to be clear. I'd like to be clear about language, though, too, about what terms. Um, that is, the tip of the nose was cut off, and it wasn't by one of the scientists or researchers. It was like a local person assisting, and it was I don't know what the hell he was thinking. And but it wasn't that they were out there hacking away at it with machetes, cackling, covered in mammoth blood, or I mean, you know, they. <laughs> They, they, I, I can understand what they were doing is that they had, you know, an objective of like, look, we need to get samples before this thing gets too warm. We want it thawed out enough that we can cut into it, but we don't want it thawing out. We want to preserve the sample. So that I can understand that, but it was just like, oh man, can you guys just wait like 10 minutes so we could take photos of this thing without chunks missing out of it, you know? Yeah. And, and so by the way, what, what, one of the things that resulted, by the way, though, of, of cutting into it, because see, Trevor and I, you know, we, we, we did too. We, we looked, we got a, we picked a strategic spot and drilled a hole in to try to get into the abdominal cavity. And we did, we left one hole, not a very big one, just big enough to put the fiber optic camera in there. Um, but the interesting thing is this whole thing of when the mammoth was first found, it was found by tusk hunters. That is, local guys who were out there looking for mammoth ivory to sell to the market. Um, and why are they doing this? Well, because, you know, a, a grade A mammoth tusk, I mean, that that's the equivalent of, I don't know, five or six years of salary if, if you find the right one. I mean, this is, you know, um, they found it. They re were cool enough to report the frozen carcass to scientists. They actually had some connections, and they, they, they tracked down – the scientists, and they're like, look, there's a whole mammoth carcass. We just want the tusks, but can you, you know? And and by the way, the, the tusk hunters repatriated the tusks. They decided this find is cool enough. Let's give the tusks back to Yana. Um, and so a team went up there in a matter of like a 48-hour endeavor. They just got on snowmobiles while the ocean was frozen over, raced up there with air hammers and generators, just hammered that thing, jackhammered that thing out of the ice, put it on a sled, and raced to Kazachie, where they decided that was going to be their, their storage place. Well, they had found, as they were hammering it out of the ice, they found that there was like goo oozing out of the mammoth. And they had it in a test tube, and they took photographs, and they go, look, mammoth blood. And they said, look, it's still liquid. And then posing the question, do mammoths have some kind of antifreeze in their blood? Because, look, we have a frozen mammoth, yet there's liquid blood coming out. However... To my understanding, unfortunately, when they got that test tube to their lab, they put it back under they, they put it back under refrigeration and accidentally it was too cold and froze the sample. So that liquid blood, they froze the sample. So if they did have liquid blood, uh, to my knowledge, they wouldn't be wouldn't have been able to prove it because they had destroyed the sample, you know, rupturing the cell walls by freezing it. Yeah. Um, but that was one of the things that we were looking for is, is this thing going to produce more blood and we you know we had two hypotheses our thing was either it's either mammoth blood and it does have maybe an antifreeze something to it or it's what we would call mammoth juice was the term <laughs> is that think think about this you, you have something that's forty two thousand years old um and mind you there's times where it's frozen and semi-frozen but again pure water freezes at freezing temperature but water with saline stuff in it with uh, proteins and salt and breaking down chemicals is probably not going to freeze at the same temperature. It's going to function like antifreeze. It's just literally all of the 
stuff from a mammoth slowly disintegrating. And so that fluid coming out, is, of course, is not water. It's saline in some way. And so it's going to freeze at a much lower temperature. That doesn't mean it's mammoth blood with antifreeze in it. And so when we, we got samples as um, these holes cut into it were there and the thing starts thawing out, lo and behold, we got a, a lot of samples of mammoth juice and looked at it under a microscope. And it's what we expected is like, well, there could be some blood here, but there's no intact blood cells. There's some tissue floating around. Um, so in, indeed, you're going to get a signature of hemoglobin. Oh, yeah, there's hemoglobin floating around in there. There was blood in there. But there's also God knows what else from the inside of the mammoth just in there. And so you get this sort of, you know, this, this soup stock effectively. So there was nothing that we could find that really demonstrated which uh, this hypothesis that wasn't even really well substantiated. It was like, well, they, when they first got the mammoth, stuff was oozing out. That doesn't mean it's blood, and it doesn't mean mammoth blood has antifreeze in it. Um, and that's, that's the case. Is when we, we've got to look at it. And again, we had a very preliminary look. We didn't do any chemical sampling, but really looking at it, at it under a really good microscope, it's like, well, if it is blood, there's nothing in, no cells intact anymore. There's a lot of sort of like cell walls floating around and stuff. But clearly there was other material in there. It's just, again, a breaking down of amino acids and so on. Um, a thing that I think didn't make it to the final edit, but was kind of a discovery, and I, I, I haven't heard much about it since, the mouth of the mammoth was relatively intact. And its mouth had jowls on the other, on both sides, like cheeks, like on a bulldog that sagged down. And this didn't appear to be just that, you know, the specimen is years old and dead, and that we're looking at a breakdown of the muscles, it, it looked as if it was actually part of the living thing, is that it had these like flaps on either side of its mouth, like jowls. And that would make sense if it was a way to basically keep the, the mouth warm. When it closes its mouth, it kind of has skin that goes around either side of it to keep it a little bit warmer. And again, these weren't like extremely huge structures, but you look at that and it's like, yeah, I never, I never imagined that, but that could make sense. And that was something that, you know, I, I recall Trevor on camera showing that, but I don't know if it ever made it into the edit. Well, certainly I have photos of it, and it, it's kind of interesting to see that. of like, Because, again, it's effectively the most intact face. Like, we didn't have the full face. We had the mouth, the, the trunk, um, and it was really by far the most intact example. And we got some interesting data out of that. Was like, look at that. It's got these kind of jowl flaps. Who would have thought? Yeah, no, that's that's um, that's an interesting structure that again, not too many people associate with um, with the woolly mammoth species. Um, yeah, I've never even heard of jowls being described on the table with any of the species. So uh, that's already like some groundbreaking data that we're you guys are finding out with Yana yeah. and all the discovery and preservation. So, all right, uh, back to you, Arson. Well, I guess the whole thing is now leading up to the question at hand um, the mammoth cloning so <laughs> the mammoth cloning so uh, what's what's the deal with mammoth cloning team what's the whole thing about uh, um, look we got uh, I mean the thought at least the, the proposals I've heard is that you know we we do procedures that have been done already with other things is that you get a modern Asian elephant You get a fertilized egg you knock out the nucleus You get a mammoth nucleus with the DNA and you stick it in there put it in an Asian elephant and Let it gestate for like a year and out comes a baby mammoth, right? Oh, it's simple It's not it doesn't. Um, first of all, just because an Asian elephant kind of looks like a mammoth in our eyes doesn't mean that they're that you can do that. And the way to consider it is this: is that we're looking at about I don't know five and a half, six million years. So keep in mind, it, it sounds really simple, right? Oh, we just do that, and there we go. We make a baby mammoth. No. Um, because for a lot of people, they think, well, a mammoth is kind of like an elephant, so we should be able to have a surrogate elephant mom. And what other options do we have? Well, one thing to consider, among many, is that the, the distance, the genetic distance between a mammoth 
uh, woolly mammoth and an Asian elephant. So we're looking at about five and a half, maybe six million years. That's almost the genetic distance between humans and chimps. Do we, so ask the question, do we have the technology for a human surrogate to carry a chimp fetus to full term or vice versa? And there aren't enough immunosuppressants. You know, nine months of pregnancy with a mother filled to the gills with immunosuppressants to be able to carry a chimpanzee fetus to full term. That, that, can't ha that won't happen. It wouldn't survive. They're, they're too different. And that's the thing to think about with mammoths, woolly mammoths and Asian elephants. They're, they're too different. It, it, you know, and you, the, the fetus would never survive full term because they're literally, again, about five and a half, six million years genetically distant. That's a lot of gene differences. That's a big enough difference that the body can't handle it. They could try. I think it would be really unfortunate for the surrogate mother because, it, you know, enough immunosuppressants that literally she will just get infections like crazy and die before, you know, I don't know. I, it's not even an ethical issue. I don't think it's going to be possible. The other concern is this. It's called, we'd call it genetic senescence. That is, our genes, as we age, they age too. Your DNA ages. Your chromosomes start crumbling away at the ends as you get older. And it may be one of the reasons for a lot of age-related diseases is that you're literally missing genes on the ends of your chromosome, chromosomes and you end up getting, there's been suspicion that things like type 2 diabetes, certain cancers, Alzheimer's can be triggered by this. Well, <clears throat> well if we're going to make a clone a mammoth, cloning a mammoth from an old, an old lady, so to speak, that is Yana, the Lyakovsky mammoth, she was in her, in her 50s. She was at a more than adult age, you know, a senior age. Is Her DNA is the DNA of an individual who's in her, her 50s. So if you had a baby mammoth and you were able to actually pull it off, you're going to have like, let's say, a little 10-year-old mammoth, a young mammoth. Although it's 10 years old, it has the genes of a 60-something-year-old. And it, it may not live long. It may not be, you know, it may not have a very long life and it may die young of age-related diseases. This is a common issue. And, and the, so that's the other concern is, is using this particular subject. It's like, okay, they, they'll hopefully have ample opportunity to get enough DNA to sequence the mammoth genome, the woolly mammoth genome. Great. But they have the genome of an older individual. And whatever they make from that is going to be effectively genetically as old. Um, there are a couple of ways it could be done. And there's other things that could be done. It could be really damn difficult to, to clone a woolly mammoth. But what if you don't clone all the mammoth? What if you clone just the meat? Can you imagine what mammoth steak would go for on the market? <laughs> and here's the thing. All the, all, the, all the materials and equipment for cloning just the meat, that's out there. That's becoming a hobby thing now of having these bioreactors where you can grow, grow your own meat. It's really slow and not incredibly productive, but people, people are even doing it as a hobby. You know, that's something that a, a bio graduate student with, you know, a few thousand dollars of equipment could do. So one of the interesting things is, you know, is SOAM Institute maybe, maybe toying with the idea of com making commercially available mammoth steak for $200,000 a bite or something. I mean, who knows? Because the technology is there. And I, I you imagine the market will be there. There'll become all kinds of superstitions surrounding it too, that mammoth, mammoth meat gives you ancient, awesome ice age powers and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I, I think we live in a world where no doubt someone would have no trouble paying $100,000 for a tiny cube of mammoth meat. And that is totally doable. I mean, it really would not be that difficult to do. Um, cloning the whole mammoth is going to be tricky. I, I think there is a way to do it. And in fact, when we were in Siberia, I spoke with one of the, the members of Soam Institute. Really nice guy. Really cool dude. And... Um, he he and you know i was asking him about like how are you guys dealing with the issue of senescence and you know he, his his mentality i think was very positive he just said look if we're ever going to clone a mammoth somebody has to start working on it now and we may not have the answers to all the questions yet but 
if it's going to happen, we should start working on it now. And, you know, we'll, as technologies progress, we can solve more of the problems in this puzzle. And I, I, I respected that. Um, and I, I pitched to him, I was like, I have an idea, by the way, that it could be done to clone a mammoth, but it would take a lot more time. And you would, you would get some payback already. You would see some progress in a few years. Um, but it could be done with the technology we have now. And it's really simple. We don't have to clone all of a mammoth. We can get some of its DNA. Let's just say we get an Asian elephant and we give it, I don't know, 1% mammoth DNA, a small fraction, 2%. What if we make a whole bunch of Asian elephant, little baby Asian elephants that have different fragments of mammoth DNA in them? But enough that it is something viable and survivable that maybe they, you know, they just have a few different genes. That's all. And they may look just like Asian elephants. They may look slightly different. Some of them might have just slightly, you know, but again, something that would be genetically survivable, very small percentage. But each one of those, of, let's say we have 20 of them, each one of those has a different chunk of the mammoth genome. Well, we start interbreeding those babies when they get of mating age. And now they can have offspring with an even greater variety of mammoth genes in them. And each generation, we could dope each generation with a few more percentages of mammoth DNA. Eventually, over a long enough time, you know, after a number of generations, you can have something that is clearly not an Asian elephant anymore. And is also not a mammoth yet. And you could probably get to a tipping point where you've got something that is like, you know, 50% mammoth and is surviving its genetic legacy that it's 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 living and it's doing all right that's when you could start then amping up more and more every generation or you might get to a point where it's like look we've got something that's like you know 70 80 percent mammoth it could be a viable surrogate mother for a full-blown mammoth clone and you know and that could take that could take decades but someone heading down that road you know, within the first generation, you could see that there is some success here. We have something kind of like a mammoth. And of course, when I when I when I shared this with with my uh, with this uh, associate at uh, the Swam Institute, you know, I, I, within a few sentences, he knew where I was going and he got a big smile. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's the other option. That would be that's one of the things that we might we might end up seeing if we ever have a cloned mammoth. That might be the way it's going to get done because the alternative of just Sticking a mammoth egg into an elephant, it, it's not going to work. It's good luck. It's it's. Um, but I'm I'm kind of hoping or suspecting that we're going to end up seeing mammoth meat on the market in some bizarre way. So, uh, how would you like your mammoth steak then, guys? Is it medium or uh, rare or well done? Fresh, not forty-two thousand years old. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'll just stick with my usual medium, whatever amount of years it is old. <laughs> so I like mine medium always. In any case, um, Josh, um, uh, your turn. Yeah, I was about to say real fast that um, I, you'd have to request your mammoth cube be anthrax free as well, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. If you buy two or more, you get free Cipro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Free antibiotics to combat anthrax. <laughs> well, but think about this. If, if they, you know, again, cloning mammoth meat is actually kind of easy. It may not be that difficult to do, growing it, basically. Um, the funny thing is, if I don't think it's going to be an issue of if. I think it's going to be an issue of when this happens. Is that somebody out there is going to pay some ridiculous sum, like $250,000, for a small mammoth burger. So, you know, I, I do see the possibility of, of we may hear in the news, maybe in a year, maybe of, hey, mammoth meat. You know, we haven't cloned a whole mammoth, but we have mammoth meat. And I think it's funny as hell, having witnessed Tusik the dog sneak off with a little mouthful of, you know, funky meat. I like the idea that there might be someone out there who will end up paying, you know, $250,000 for a mammoth shish kebab little piece of meat, while Tusik the dog got it for free, which I find funny <laughs> as hell. Nice. And yeah, and like you said, Tusik was the, your canary. She she kind of uh, 
proof the mammoth meat to make sure it wasn't infected with Ice Age pathogens. <laughs> yeah. So you see, he stepped up and volunteered for that experiment. And again, it was one like, well, what are you going to do? Am I going to chase the dog down and grab? It didn't, wasn't much. But do I chase the dog down and grab this little bite of meat out of its mouth? It was like stuff. It was all funky, rotting, hanging off of it anyway. And like, mm -hmm. what, what would be the point? Not to mention, I would be running right across the camera with my mic on. It was a disaster. So I just sat back and kind of went, well, let it happen. Just this is a funny photo opportunity. Take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> just let it go. Uh, <laughs> awesome. All right. So uh, moving on to the next question. Um, along with the preservation, you've already kind of touched up that there was preservation of the mouth, the lips, the jowls of the lower half of the mammoth. Um, and uh, we, you actually talked a little bit about the most, to date, the most complete preserved woolly mammoth trunk. Um, what about it struck you in terms of like, you know, what you saw from the woolly mammoth trunk? And what we, what we got wrong with paleo art from like Charles Knight's era or earlier uh, depictions of paleo art with woolly mammoths, like you know what what really struck you as unique with uh, that woolly mammoth trunk? Well, I could never talk smack about Charles Knight. Everything <laughs> he did was dead on and awesome. We got to leave Charles Knight alone. Um, <laughs> I I think the Flintstones got it wrong. Um, <laughs> no, as far as paleo art. Um, I don't know. I, I would say that it, it uh, most of the portrayals I've seen of mammoths are, are pretty spot on. I think on the trunk, if you looked at the trunk too, the hair was, it wasn't just all straight, like coarse straight hair, like horse hair. It had a bit of a waviness to it, a curliness in some areas, you know, and you can see that it was orange. That That is not necessarily to indicate that we had a redhead mammoth. Um, you, you get that sometimes as the hair gets older, you start losing pigment, the pigment breaks down. And, um, so, uh, I would say the interesting thing is if you get a look at the images or take a look at the show is you can see the, the surface, the undersurface of the mammoth trunk didn't have hair. And part of that, if I could guess, if it's again, behaving like elephants, is that, that that's a sensory organ, if you will, that the underside of its trunk is actually a powerful sensory organ, and it needs touch, you know, it was probably heavily innervated, and so it needs to be like the palms of our hands, you know, they need to be just free of any obstructions and hair and anything, because it, 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 it is, the trunk is basically like its hand, it's its sensing organ. So you can see that the majority of the underside of the trunk was, there's no hair, but then a lot of hair on the top to keep it warm, which was kind of cool. Um, another thing, I, I, I uh, again, I don't think it made it into the show, but there was this moment when the mammoth was thawed out enough that it was not a frozen thing anymore. It was now cold meat, if you will. And there was this moment where I grabbed Trevor and it's like, dude, come here, we got to do this. And we just knelt in front of it and it basically it was sort of her her left side, that is her left behind her front leg, her left side, I took off my glove and I looked over at Trevor and he got what I was doing. And I just put my bare hand on the side of the mammoth. And that was a really cool moment because it's like, this is feeling, you know, one of the few humans in the last 11.5 thousand years that can tell you what a mammoth feels like. And the skin, the skin was soft. It wasn't frozen anymore after we thought it. It was soft. It gave way. It had this texture about it, this sort of like, again, this leathery, how you would imagine an elephant feels like. And it was kind of moving. Although it was cold, it was just this moving moment, especially because we'd been through hell to get that far. <laughs> and, 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 and the thing is, we were doing it as scientists. We were, you know, we're there. We're going to, let's, let's take a look at what this thing has to offer. It became that moment where we'd, we'd made it, we'd found it, we're not thawing it out, we're looking at it. But then there became that human moment of like, you know what, there's me as a human being and Trevor as a human being. You know, as a kid, what kid would would you say, hey, you wanna, would you like to actually touch a real woolly mammoth? Who would say no? Nobody would, you know? And so there's this moment, it just became like human to be like, let's 
let's actually touch this thing. We get to be some of the first people, the only people around that can tell you what it, a, a woolly mammoth feels like. And it was, it was moving. It became this kind of profound moving moment. And, and, um, you know, we were there kind of hypnotized, just smiling, just this kind of sheepish smiles on our faces getting you know, like choked up actually, because, you know, we were, we were so wrapped up in all this hectic logistics and science and stuff of just that moment to go, stop what you're doing and wrap your head around what is happening right now. You're touching a woolly mammoth and you can feel the texture of its skin and it's, it was a huge thing. It was like one of the, I think one of the, just the biggest moments in my life, that brief moment to just stop for a second and take off the damn glove and just put your hand on her side and feel it. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, no, that sounds, uh, it, it looked um, incredible from the images. I remember that um, when you had me reconstruct the mammoth, because we, we, we did an illustration of Yana, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, we had, you gave me just tons of photos to cite in terms of like the hair, uh, the, the trunk, the impacted molar in the inside of the mouth. And um, I remember watching uh, the images of the this uh, woolly mammoth trunk, and then just being awestruck in terms of like the preservation, the fur, how far down the trunk the fur actually was present, um, the the lobes, the detail in the lobes, how like de uh, dexterous the the actual lobe of the trunk was to pick things up. It was a lot of like you know you know unique things that a guy like me who's been around mammoths for a while. You, I've never gotten to see any of this stuff, you know, and, and it's ironic that you could be a paleontologist in the field for years and never even get a glimpse of like a complete mammoth trunk. <laughs> you know, I, I kind of felt guilty also that the fact is there are thousands of people out there who study mammoths and, and I am sure all of them would kill to be able to, to touch a woolly mammoth, you know, to touch a, actual flesh of a woolly mammoth and of all the damn people out there i got to do it and i'm again i mean i'm i'm not a specialist in this it was something that it just kind of happened and i'm rolling with it and still learning as i go along but it, and that that was something i kind of felt like i i hope others will get a chance to touch yana someday you know yes and, and not as a steak mind you <laughs> Not not as a not as a piece of food. Uh, hopefully, yeah. Not <laughs> eat Yana, but touch, not taste Yana. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, back to you, Art. <laughs> yeah, you guys are funny, aren't you? <laughs> cool, cool stuff. Um, well, I mean, who knows? Maybe I will be able to touch her one day because uh, you know I. I travel to Russia fairly frequently because that's where I'm actually from, where I was born. Although I wasn't born in Saint Petersburg or Moscow, I was from I'm from the south, which is Rostov na Donu. You might have heard, uh, Tim, or maybe not. But uh, yeah, there is actually a specimen of mammoth um, in. Uh, I don't know if it's actually a replica or not. I'll have to ask about it later. But uh, there is one in the Azov Museum there as well, so it could well be another specimen of mammoth of sort. So I'll have to check that out. Now, my next question uh, would be, what's your take on the so-called mammoth nose mittens idea? And uh, if applicable, uh, or applicable, I don't actually know how to say that word properly. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, do you think that uh, Colombian mammoth also had it? And if so, would you be able to cite any particular abstract for it? Thank you I, I, I'd have to say I... I haven't read the article about the nose mitten thing, but I've heard the overall description of what the proposal is. It, 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 look, looking at the trunk I saw, there was nothing like that. <laughs> and that, as far as I understand, this proposal came from examining a specimen that wasn't really intact, fully intact. It was kind of, you know, degraded. And so you can get, you know, the you can get the muscles breaking down and just going soft and the, the skin, you know, just starts coming loose. Uh, I don't know if what is being proposed yet constitutes significant enough evidence to say that something like that exists. And to the contrary, the example I saw with Yana, there was nothing like that on Yana. 
You know, the, the trunk is all completely rigid. There aren't flaps or anything like that. And what I described earlier of these jowls around the mouth, completely different area and completely different thing is that it has like, you know, again, like a, like a bulldog or something like that. It has these sort of flap cheek flaps that kind of go down over the mouth. Not the same thing as this mitt, this mitten. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think there's enough yet to substantiate it. I, we'll have to wait and see and see maybe another example will show up. But I, I get the suspicion that it is, again, just not using an ideal sample that just had loose, crappy skin. <laughs> yeah, and um, I'll chime in real fast because I, I have read the abstract. Um, and it's it's a 2015 abstract um, from ResearchGate. Um, and the article is um the, the title of the article is new data on trunk morphology in the woolly mammoth and this is by uh Flitinoff. uh and he and he has an, a ton of co-authors on this paper uh, at least four or five so it would be Plitinoff um et al 2015 so that would be the paper um and looking at this paper um there's very loose uh, diagrams and examples he gives. The one primary example he gives is of a, a woolly mammoth trunk uh, from 1799, and this this mammoth has a, a preserved trunk, but it's it's very it's not near the preservation that we're seeing on Yana. It, it's very degraded. It's very uh, loose skin. All the muscle tissue seems to have dissolved from inside of it. So it, it's giving these false structures that you would see on any animal that would be um, degraded, that you see like flappy skin. And that, that's not because these animals have skin flaps. It's because the muscles are just gone and the skin loosens up. And when you have a structure that's primarily muscle tissue, uh, that, that, that structure is going to start deforming in really funky ways. And um, uh, as Tim has said, the concept of nose mittens is pretty much debunked just from the discovery of Yana and her trunk. And not only Yana, but other uh, woolly mammoth specimens that we have in terms of a, a ton of the baby mammoths that have been recovered with intact trunks as well that don't show any of these trunk structures either. So it's not the question of does the Colombian mammoth and the woolly mammoth also have these mitten structures. Uh, the question is, do any of these mammoths have these mitten structures, in which the answer right now would be no. No, mammoths do not have nose mittens. <laughs> yeah, I, again, it's it's one that I... I can, I'm not going to make an official declaration because I haven't read the paper, and I want to be fair to the scholars that did it, but it just from what I've heard and what I understand about the data, is it, I, I think they need to get more samples, you know, because it does sound like it, it's trying to make a proposal for a new morphological feature, but from samples that are kind of like pretty aged roadkill, where it may not be the f easiest way to, to make an identification like that. Um, and we have to consider, though, too, so the, the, the Yana, the Lyakovsky mammoth trunk, again, it has hair on all over it except for the underside. And you got to remember, it's a very flexible uh, you know, limb, if it get you know if it's in the middle of a snowstorm and it gets too cold, it can just curl its trunk up, you know, and just you know wrap its trunk up. It doesn't need to have some special fold. And we know also mammoths like elephants habitually will rest their trunk on their tusks. And there there's right there's right-handed and left-handed, if you will, that you can see wear patterns on the top sides of the tusks where they'll rest their trunk on it and it just wears at it. And is it you know. So I, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I don't know, I, there, other than this claim, again, that's based on rather degraded samples and maybe off, um, I, I don't know what evidence there is for it. And we just have to keep our eyes open. Maybe there will be an intact mammoth that has those folds, but never saw anything like that on Yana. Yeah, I uh, I suppose I uh, could uh, perhaps like you know insert a funny meme here and uh, ask do mammoths have feathers? <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah, do mammoths have feathers? Oh, we, let's not go down that road. <laughs> How about we just don't go down that road? 
it'll really or we could go down that road if you want to listen to Josh get into a frenzy. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to listen to what Josh sounds like when he gets really annoyed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> By the way, um, feathered mammoths that I hear is the new um, plot for Jurassic World Four. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's uh, because the plot three was the insurance claim because of the yeah. crappy stuff that's happening on the island there and all that stuff being destroyed and trashed. And um, yes, part four is going to be feathered mammoths and uh, part five, I think, will be scaly mammoths. So, yeah, exactly. yeah. There we go. All right, then, Josh, uh, do you want to take over then? Yeah, so this is um, the last official question that we have. Um, so you, you've talked about all the incredibly like preserved ice age fossils that you guys found in the field, uh, mainly mammoth uh, that we that was found in the field. Um, when you and I last talked, uh, you also shared with me some incredible pres preserved like soft tissue from the museums, including Saint Petersburg, um, which I think is worth talking about. Um, cause it's stuff nobody even knows existed. I didn't even know it existed until you showed me photos. Um, so what, what other amazing specimens from the St. Petersburg museum and other museums while you were at on location with national geographic, uh, would you think would be, uh, honorable mention? Oh, beyond honorable mention. I I'd say <laughs> again, if you, if you like mammoths, go to the St. Petersburg museum, do it because, um, again, they have, uh, you know, they have the Berezovka mammoth there. They have the Adams mammoth there. They've got Masha, a little mummified baby Masha and Dima. And, um, you know, if you like mammoths, that's that's you're hitting some of the big ones all in one place. I think they have um, Genia might be on display now. When we were there, they were still preserving Genia. All I got to see was a leg that you know was in pretty bad condition again you know we were talking about this mammoth mitten trunk mitten thing it's like you see this leg and you know in theory it's a leg but it's really a lot of bone with a lot of loose skin and muscle you know that they were preserving and of course it stinks like mammoth um <laughs> but uh Genia might be on display now and um i don't know yet but also as a museum it, i would say it's one of the most beautiful um museums that, uh, that is a biological history museum, biological science museum, um, because they've kept it old school is the way they put it, that the museum is, I think, a few hundred years old, and they've kept it in this sort of style of a few centuries ago, where it's these beautiful cabinets with just rows and rows and rows of birds and things like that, um, you know, and, and um, it's... it's view a museum of the past to look like in a it's how most of us view a museum in the past to really look like we're just you know an entire room of whale skeletons and cetacean skeletons and it's just it's it's as an art form in itself that is not being done in museums the way it used to um you know you want to see a, a thylacine and if you'd like to see a dodo bird go there it's kind of <laughs> cool um and also, um, in, in Yakutia, that is, in Saka Republic, that is on the other side of Russia, um, where we were spent most of our time, uh, in the city of Yakutsk, a pretty good, pretty big-sized city there, um, the Siberian Northwestern Federal University, they're the ones, as far as I know, that are, that are in custody of Yana, and um, they have a museum. Uh, it, there's a museum there and it's actually one of my favorite museums too. I was, I didn't know it existed it, when I was there. They had a, they had a woolly rhino skeleton on display and woolly rhinos are cool. Oh, by the way, St. Petersburg as well. They've got the mummified head of a woolly rhino, which is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that's like, it's, you know, uh, so, um, yeah, in, in, in the, uh, in Yakutsk, in the Siberian Northwestern Federal University, they have their own sort of museum. And they've got a nice collection. You know, it's also, uh, to my recollection, it's they have like, for example, mammoth hide that has been preserved. So it's almost kind of like leather. And they've got, uh, again, woolly rhino, skeletons, and, and all of your favorites. <laughs> Do you guys hear that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And so their their museum was pretty spectacular again because they have like, for example, Cave Bear. 
that there may actually be a special kind of Arctic cave bear that was smaller. Um, and so they've, they've got, it, it was, it was a, it was a, a hell of a few hours wandering through there, just glassy eyed looking at all the stuff they have, because again, they're one of the few museums that isn't just exhibiting skeletons, but they are exhibiting preserved tissue as well, which is really cool. Yeah. No, I know. I remember, um, you sent me pictures like there was one picture you sent me where it was just a display case of nothing but like cave lion skulls. Yep. Uh, that was really amazing to see. Um, another picture you sent me, they had a mounted uh, paleo bison skull with the fur, like fur patches still preserved on the skull. <laughs> like, oh, there, yeah. There, there was some oh, incredible yeah. stuff that I remember seeing like, oh, my God, this is, you know, soft tissue preservation is my thing. Uh, as you know that we've been doing with the dinosaur skin charts, but if you if you want to talk about ice age soft tissue preservation, I mean these museums have some of the most extensive soft tissue preservation for fauna that I, I've ever even seen anywhere in the world. Oh, absolutely! You know, and that's that's the thing is I think a lot of North American paleontologists, ice age paleontologists, you know, are are, are certainly have a right to be a bit jealous. Because you have these these folks working in an area of the world where they're they're not just getting skeletons, they're getting frozen materials like yana, and that's that's those are really rare and precious. And as climate is changing, um, you know, I think maybe we need to spend more time looking for more, searching for more of those specimens before they melt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> So yeah, no, as far as uh, as far as that is, I'm I'm all wrapped up uh, here. Uh, Arson, back to you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Josh, and thank you, team, once again for answering. It was really nice to hear about these interesting specimens and uh, something I am already dying to check out. But you're just making it even more interesting, so I'm gonna be teleporting, I guess. I'd lost audio. We Okay, uh, thanks very much. I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to hear more about these uh, specimens of the mammoths and other things from that museum. I'm already like dying to go there, but I guess I'll be teleporting now. So yeah, maybe tomorrow morning when they open up. In any case, my uh, question would be uh, that this, uh, along with the uh, Castroville mammoth, what additional animals uh, were discovered on the same area in the farming grounds, Tim? Yeah, see, th this was something that didn't really make it to the press. And, and I think it's because the, the press coverage, it was just like, hey, a mammoth, the first one ever found in Monterey County. And we didn't really advertise it because, again, we were concerned about safety and security, that we didn't want, um, you know, just looters or somebody showing up thinking that they're going to find the La Brea tar pits, which it, that's not, wasn't the case. But it's, it's that we were, the area we were digging was clearly some kind of mud trap in some kind of waterway, and that not only was there a mammoth, or at least 20% of the mammoth, is there were other other animals clearly met their fate um, in the same area, and we found uh, mastodon, we found uh, camelops hysternus, that is yesterday's camel, um, we found um, megalonyx jeffersoni, the uh, Jefferson's ground sloth, and um, we found bison also. Yo, know, Josh, do you remember which which bison? It wasn't latifrons, was it? Uh, no, I mean, we, we only found the teeth, um, right. so we wouldn't even be able to determine what yeah. it was. Uh, but it was probably um, antique bison. Yeah. Bison uh, so the big, yeah, so the one with the bit, the really long neural spines that go up the shoulder. Uh, yeah. It almost looks like a fin. It's it's pretty wild species. <laughs> and there was, there was also a, a horse, but it's hard when you get to those, when you get to a certain stage of horse evolution sometimes it's hard to tell which one you're looking at but we were getting we were getting some kind of of small horse you know something the size of a little burro or something like that and we were also getting by the way horses in siberia as well that were showing up with the uh, woolly mammoths cool awesome sauce and, uh, 
now I uh, guess uh, next question, uh, Josh. Go <laughs> ahead. Yeah, no, actually, to expand on the Castroville dig, um, so one of the things that made it interesting, uh, that the reason why we discovered it was an estuary was the sheer amount of shells that we found at the site. Like, we were finding oyster shells. We were finding uh, there was a giant clam shell that we uncovered. Um, there was a lot of, like, ocean material. I think we had some people from... Uh, uh, I think it was uh, UCLA that came down uh, to take some sedimentary samples, and they found, like, shark teeth. So Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. it was the guys from UCLA were looking. They were finding microfossils. Yeah, so the, we definitely, I think they reported finding shark teeth. It was, it was funny because there was one point where we were walking down uh, from Site B to Site A, Site A being where the mammoth was, and I was just looking, uh, scanning the sediments, and I found this object, and I plucked it out of the rock, and it was um, it was a rabbit jaw. It was a, it was a fossilized rabbit jaw. <laughs> and there's this great shot where we have like this Tupperware of nothing but insectivores and a rodent species, and it, uh, along with that was just the giant rabbit jaw that we literally dug up out of the sand like a couple of minutes later. So, yeah, I mean that that site was like it was unnaturally rich with fossils for for it just being a mammoth site like we had a lot of large fauna um I, I think me and tim the one question we had was uh where were all the carnivores like we didn't find any carnivores and anything like in terms of apex predator we were counting on finding an apex predator but, but we never found anything close to like a dire wolf or a saber cat or even a regular lion uh which was one of the big mysteries that revolved around the castroville dig remember that tim yeah, but, you know, see, I think there was a similar pattern nearby because the Bay Area actually has quite a few fossil beds and, and sites like this. Um, There's an area in Fremont that decades ago, decades ago, they were getting the same faunal assemblage that we were finding. And, and I think it was the same thing as there was sort of an absence of predators. If I had to guess for the Castroville site, it's simply because, well, things like dire wolves aren't going to get stuck in the mud the way a mammoth would. You know, again, like modern African elephants, you, you can see, you'll look up online, you'll see images of modern African elephants that have gotten trapped in a muddy lake bed and their own body weight just shoves them down in the mud. You don't get that with, you know, canids and things like that. They're a bit too nimble and a little too light. I mean, why would you get that at the La Brea Tar Pits? Well, that's different. Sticky, sticky, bituminous uh, tar is a lot harder to get out of once you're trapped in it than just mud. And um, I, I think that might be one of the reasons, is we're just getting larger, clumsy megafauna that are, you know, getting stuck in the mud and dying. But then, you know, saber cats and things like that, not as large, not as likely, you know. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it's it's one of those ongoing things. Like, it, it was strange, because we had, like, this huge window into the ecology for Castroville um, with this site. Um, but you know, at the same time we were looking for more answers in terms of like, okay, well, what, what was feeding on these animals? You know, <laughs> like right. that was the big question right. all of us had was like, well, who's feeding on all the dead herbivores, <laughs> you know? And it's, it was just one of those ongoing things. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think you can also, I mean, we have natural examples in among living mammals that you can have areas where you just don't really have a lot of predators. Just because there's a niche for a predator doesn't mean that that something always falls into that niche. You know that you can have again roaming bison uh, nowadays that aren't necessarily getting you know ganked by predators other than the little babies or of course wolf bait. But <laughs> that's what I'm taking out of this this interview: wolf bait. <laughs> wolf bait. Hashtag wolf bait. All right. <laughs> So, all right, uh, question, uh, bonus question number two. Uh, where is our old friend, the Colombian mammoth? Where is the final resting place for the Colombian mammoth? Like, where did all these fossils end up? Well, um, it's not a final resting place yet, but it's, it's that we have thousands of fragments. Um, it is currently at Foothill College, uh, right here in the Bay Area. Foothill College in uh, Los Altos Hills, California. 
Um, the Foothill College Lab, it's, the, it's actually the archaeology lab, has the uh, mammoth remains. And we have a number of students who have been working diligently for several years now, um, basically gluing bits back together. And keep in mind, things like a, we, we found a scapula, a shoulder blade, but it, is, it was so fragmented. It's in tiny little pieces that we may never just get around to gluing it together. It might not really be possible. Um, so we have, they're currently right now, they're being conserved. And we, uh, when we get enough of it together to have something to display, we're, of course, the, the families, the, the family who own the property and the family who are the farmers on the property, um, it, it's their decision of where to put it. And so that may be another few years, but there, you know, there'd been discussion of having it, uh, discussion of having it on display, perhaps in Castroville. So the people of Castroville can see what came out of their soil. But right now it's becoming a slow, arduous process of just gluing it bit by bit back together of what we have. And again, keep in mind, we've got about 20% of a mammoth. So, but it's still cool. Yeah, no, I know. Um, I mean, we, we tell people 20% of a mammoth. Um, we also got to remind people, too, though, that shy of the Liberia tar pits, I mean, even in the Liberia tar pits, we rarely get an articulated specimen. Uh, so what we get are jumbles of bones and almost all of the skeleton mounts that you see at the tar pits are chimeras. Right. So not one of those assemblages are from like one solitary animal. It, it's from the dozens upon dozens of assemblages that they find at the tar pits. So to even find 20% of an animal um, is still a good amount. Like, for an example, there I think there was a mammoth that was that is on display at the, the, the Children's Museum up north. Was that, was that the museum, Tim? Right, the Children's Discovery Museum in San Jose. Yeah, so that mammoth, uh, for the most part, is comprised of just the skull. And maybe, like, a bit of, like, femur or scapula. Something like that, yeah. Something yeah. like that. But to put it in contrast with the Castroville mammoth, the Children's Museum mammoth is less than maybe, like, 10%. Yeah. So the Castroville mammoth actually has a larger percentage for um, materials discovered for a single animal. Right. Which, when you're looking at 20%, that's actually pretty high. That's that's actually very abnormal for the your your average Joe to discover, it like on a, in a in a wash or on a farm or something like that. So it is very significant to find that 20% of an animal. Uh, that is a large, especially when you're talking about mammoth, because it's like, okay, 20% of a mammoth. What is that? And it's like, well, if you start adding up the square footage, uh, scapula alone is like over two to three feet. Uh, a femur, you know, or a hum the humeral head is like as big as my head. It's a bowling ball size of an a of a of a bone process. So even though it's twenty percent of an animal, it starts adding up really fast. Like oh, like twenty percent of an animal, cool. It's like yeah, but that's twenty percent of a mammoth. That's still gonna start um, filling up a couple of shelves worth of of bones and whatnot. Oh yeah. <laughs> But see, if, if we only found four more mammoths, we could put together one complete skeleton. That would be great. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> no, that's definitely the angle. <laughs> All right, back to you, Arson. Sure thing. Um, well, uh, we've read up on the uh, mammoth task miners in Russia and uh, not Geo, even though that isn't National Geographic, in case somebody didn't understand my abbreviation there from the viewers, they even released a companion uh, issue shortly before your special was released. Now, we've heard that some real dangers with task mining concerning rock slides and cave-ins uh, like happening, like was this uh, danger like a real thing uh, to you when, while you were, you know, that you were encountering during the filming, uh, and, you know, the segment where you were in the caves? Uh, was that like the real thing? Like that? that yeah, actually it's not. Gets... You saw the caves. It's not really safe. I mean, I thought it was safe enough, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's afterwards. It found out like the following day, the cave had collapsed. It was like, oh, maybe it wasn't as safe as I thought it was. <laughs> um, from what I, a couple of things about about the the, the tusk mining here, um, that is tusk hunting, is you can understand the local motivation. Is that 
you have these towns that are really remote. Income and means for an income is very limited. I mean, a lot of them are like fishing and things like that. And then here, all of a sudden, uh, through change of interest, um, mammoth ivory becomes as appealing as African elephant ivory. And in fact, there was, from what I understand, about over a decade ago, there was a point is that you have a lar large, for example, Chinese consumer market for, for elephant ivory. And the thought was like, hey, what if we try to get them interested in mammoth ivory instead to really take the pressure off of, you know, not driving African elephants into extinction or even just the, you know, killing them just to take the damn ivory, which is also just really horrible. And it's, as far as I understand, it's kind of started to backfire because you have these populations up, up way up north that are just surrounded by thousands and thousands of mammoths and just coming out of the hillsides and um and it it seems like it's a practice now for a lot of villages for like the month of summer that is august effectively that the villages become somewhat depopulated where anybody under the age of or yeah anybody above the age of about 12 or 13 and under the age of like 55 or 60 the men <clears throat> the men are out there potentially risking their lives to go hunt for ivory and a lot of them are going to the coast they're going to the north coast and there's a danger there because that's where the polar bears come to come looking for food and uh you know issues about global warming and whatever all we can say is this is that the polar bears usually show up not fat and healthy the way we usually see them in movies but their 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 habitat is changing, and they're getting a little bit desperate and not as well fed, thus making them even more dangerous. And so there is a concern. And these these are people that have lived in and amongst these creatures for a long time, you know. And and even now, it seems like the sentiment is that yeah, you you don't go there unless you have a rifle and a few guns, and don't go alone. Go you know you go in groups because uh, people are you know, getting attacked people and it's, you don't, and you got to think about it. They're doing this for the sake of getting mammoth ivory, but for them and with economic differentials, I mean, again, a, a matching pair of tusks, that's, I mean, you can retire on that easily and live well. And we noticed that in the town of Kachie is that the homes there were, were a lot better. That is, everybody seemed to be rebuilding their home. It was one of the few small towns where we, we, we were seeing like satellite dishes on the roofs and stuff like that. And how is it that this small remote town, there are no roads to this town. And it's like a day boat ride from the next large, next thing that is a town. And how do they have all this stuff? And it's like, oh, it's because of the, they're sitting on a gold mine. They're sitting literally in the middle of a gold field. And, um, and and of course there's you know operate there's a large organized operations. I wouldn't use the term mafia. People want to use that as some as a kind of a term to describe it, but I wouldn't say that. But there are these organized collective operations um, to con to make sure to also control these resources, because the the rumored rumored gone around that there had been, for example, poachers, that there had actually been a poacher from China who was caught, and they chased the guy out back over the border and. Um, because this is a huge commodity now. But so things have kind of backfired. That is, okay, it's alleviating pressure from living elephants, but now what is it doing to the fossil record? These things have been in the permafrost for thousands of years. You know, Yana the mammoth had been doing just fine for the last 42,000 years being frozen in the permafrost. Um, the only reason she was discovered was because of the, the, the tusks, okay, Luckily, the, the, the tusk hunters were cool enough to contact researchers and go, hey, go find this, check it out. But I saw in these operations, I saw tusk hunters where you see just a field of bones, just a, a pile of museums worth of bones that were simply excavated out because they were in the way of the tusks. They're just going through the permafrost to look for the tusks. And the bones are merely byproducts that are kind of cast aside. And it was kind of sad. I mean, I, I literally saw at Muskaya, I saw 
dozens of mammoth skulls, like really cool, intact, full woolly mammoth skull just laying there, you know. And, and it would be nice, at least if they are doing this, that these, quote, byproducts, that is, the rest of these skeletons, if they do something with them, museums, museums would love to have a, a woolly mammoth skeleton. Okay, we don't have the tusks. We'll make plastic ones. But, you know, the fact is, is you have this bone, you have this, you have this non-fossilized mammoth skull that's been doing just fine for 27,000 27, years in the permafrost. You take it out because it's in the way and you're looking for something and then you just leave it on the ground. It will disintegrate uh, with sunlight and temperature change. It'll disintegrate in a couple of years. And it would be, it, I mean, hell, I don't think there's going to be a way to stop these guys, but it would be great if they recognized a side industry of, okay, get this organized, get it through done through the Russian government legally and create a thing of like, look, we also got a bunch of mammoth skeletons we keep finding. Maybe a museum would like it, you know, that... But this, this, the, the tusk hunting, this whole mammoth ivory market is becoming a catastrophe for the paleontology of the region. Because, again, all of these other things, I mean, who cares about finding bison hair? They don't. And there isn't a market for it. And, um, and it is destructive to sites. And, and unnecessarily so. That's the thing. Is I, I don't mean to criticize these people either. They, they're doing this because this is, this is putting a roof over their heads. This is so they can eat. And, you know, it's because the conditions, the working conditions are dangerous. They're not comfortable. They're doing it because this is a way to make, make money. However, I think there's got to be a solution that everybody can win. And it's like, hey, there's a lot, of, a lot of paleontologists out there that would happily go up there and look at what you guys are finding and find a home for these that so the public researchers can look at this stuff and so yeah it's it's been kind of a mess yeah it's um I t i'm totally in agreement that uh, there's gotta be eventually like some kind of balance achieved you know like a good compromise because uh, obviously you can't ignore the issue of the fact that they are uh, in need of doing something and me obviously as a person who comes from russia like i already said so I know uh, a variety of people who came from these kind of areas originally, they moved down to the area where I am from, basically, for like studying universities, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, they told us a lot as well about the fact that the living conditions are just completely different. It's like, it's not, it's almost like you're not even living in the same country at all. It's almost like day and light kind of difference between living on a European part in like bigger cities of Russia and living in like these areas where like they're you know where the mammoths are basically it's a totally different story so yes it's understandable but uh, at the same time it has its drawbacks for science and we love science science is awesome we want science to not you know have any side effects negative ones in particular we kind of want it you know we want everyone to kind of benefit i guess so I, let's let's have fingers crossed that the mutually uh, you know beneficial solution will be achieved eventually well that's that's the case with the Lyakovsky mammoth with yana and I, I think that maybe that that can be emphasized as a, a new way to do it <clears throat> is that the tusk hunters like they 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 did the right thing they basically contacted people going, hey, look, there's something of scientific value of, of beyond, you know, we're here for the tusks, for financial value, but there's something of, of scientific value that you guys should know about. And I like that, and, I, and I, I, I'm assuming that is a kind of a normal practice, or I'm hoping it is among the tusk hunters, that they also, when they find something, because they're finding a lot of stuff, and they find something like this, that they are reaching out and kind of going, hey, you know what, you guys need to know about this. Here's where it is. And again, the thing that I liked is that the tusk hunters with the Lyakovsky mammoth were willing to repatriate her tusks, that she got her tusks back after all, because that would have that, that was a lot of money for them. But uh, you can see that they realized that they had come across something bigger than effectively mining a resource. And, and they did the right thing. And I think that was really cool of them and, uh, you know, and admirable. And so I'm hoping that kind of relationship that brought about the discovery of the Lyakovsky mammoth becomes more of a common thing. And in fact, you know, um, 
the thing to keep in mind, though, too, is that a lot of the people that are doing this, like there, I think there is a licensing thing that still goes on where you can have a license, but not everybody has one. So there is poaching in the area, but that it becomes more of a practice where it's still safe for the poachers to be like, hey, we think we found a, a frozen woolly rhino, which would be exciting if they could feel comfortable enough and safe enough that they could go to authorities and let them know that. Uh, yeah, that's a good point as well. I mean, and also you, you you have to consider that they all kind of probably know each other in that area where they do it. So if one person did that and showed a successful example of how it can truly work out for the best for everyone, uh, there is obviously going to be a chance that others will pick up on it too and they will carry on the practice. Right. So, yeah, awesome sauce. Uh, all right, Josh, dive in. <laughs> all right so um in the segment um as you as you pointed out tim there's a there's a portion where i think it's when you guys first arrive at the fields of the permafrost and there's just dozens of skeletons so many skeletons that you guys were actually able to articulate an impromptu mammoth skeleton oh yeah yeah, and, and I remember um, that was something that you actually had the brainchild to do. Like You were like, hey, let's see if we have enough bones to make a, an, an impromptu mammoth skeleton. And you did. We, we see it in the special. Um, is, that, is that kind of like the, the uh, general feel of that entire... Like, is that a, a good idea about how many bones are being uh, just there? Like, is, is that how many bones are there on that site? Oh, you just saw a fraction. Oh, you, you you just saw you just saw. <laughs> mind you, that was that was that wasn't like we went all. We didn't have a lot of time for that, and um, that was literally the bones that were right around us. Could we put together a mammoth? And we kind of rushed through it of just the bones around us. You know, it. And, and mind you, not all of this stuff was completely um, man-made debris, if you will. It's that those cliff sides thaw out. And things just start falling out of the cliff sides. You just get, oh, hey, another mammoth skull is coming out of the side of it. And so some of it's part of a natural process, too. And um, But, yeah, it's just uh, it's amazing. It's like there were dozens and dozens and, you know, um, a bison, horse, and a mammoth. We really had our eyes open for rhino. Woolly rhino would have been cool. But that that I don't think we ever ended up actually finding anything that really came out as woolly rhino if i recall i remember um i remember that you told me a story that you visited somebody at one of the other towns and you and they were using a skull as like a doorstop <laughs> like, yeah well like yeah was... i mean yeah no that's the thing is it's not out of lack of respect that's one of the things that's interesting is that when you found them in settings like in a village or something like that it wasn't that they were um they didn't treat it as a symbol of respect because in fact the the uh, the province Saka Republic their flag is a mammoth skull or is a mammoth you know I mean it that's that's like their state symbol if you will and there is a, a, a some a, a kind of reverence for these materials um, and so that's the case so you know a lot of people in town they'll have like a mammoth tooth just in their house but not as a doorstop you know, it would be something. It would be something like on the mantle, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but at the sites where where tusk hunting is taking place is a little different. You know, it was. It, and again, you got to figure for them. They're they're going for the most valuable thing. And why are we going to bother with all of this weight of <clears throat> of other fossil materials? We did, and it doesn't seem like they have the infrastructure set up for it. That is to say, the mammoth ivory market and black market are very powerful and there's a really clear flow of materials out of that area um, but something like well how the hell do we get mammoth skulls out of here and who really wants one and will we have buyers on uh, over the border really you know pay us a lot of money for a mammoth skull probably not or at least per pound not at all the way mammoth ivory is valued yeah, no, I mean, in, in terms of, um, like, the the example of just the bones that are just there in the doorway, it, it's mainly just to, to illustrate to other people, like, exactly how much material I'm thinking in my head, and I'm thinking a lot, <laughs> is that is so common in these areas. It's, like, almost 
almost like fields of bones that are just there and just you know as as he pointed out just thawing out of the hill like they're literally just spilling out of the hill every time the summer comes and and the rains hit and the 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 ice turns to water and it right it washes it down a stream you know <laughs> but it, but it, but it, it doesn't seem like it's that it's like that everywhere it's just that you'll have these areas that are clearly deposits and then you know, and and you have to know as a tusk hunter, you have to know where the big deposit areas are and go there. Um, you know, but it doesn't mean that that you just wherever you throw a rock, you'll hit a fossil. But <laughs> but see, things like a river. If you think about it, things like a river, the rivers will traffic will traffic materials. Things will come out of the river banks and get brought down the river. So even walking along river banks might be a way where you find. A wayward. I mean, we on the show we were finding wayward chunks of mammoth uh, tusk in the river that had washed, you know, from probably maybe even miles away. Yeah, no, it's funny. Um, it's funny, really fast uh, before we wrap up that you mentioned just how the rivers worked because I remember um, when we when you invited me to be uh, a guest speaker and the at, at, uh, Stanford when he gave a lecture about the Casherville mammoth and mammoths in the Bay Area. Uh, sure enough, after the lecture had ended, someone came to us with yet another mammoth. Right, <laughs> like, right. Like it, was, it was known as the, the Pacifica mammoth. I think it's what it's been called. But... I don't think it even got a title, but it's basically that, oh, great, more mammoth is coming. Oh, geez, there's... What? <laughs> Enough with the mammoths already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for me, it's exciting because, you know, guys like me, we never get tired of it. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it was it was one of those moments where it's like, yeah, is this kind of the eureka moment that they have almost every summer in these uh, in these bone assemblages that happen um, out in the middle of the Siberia? Because I mean, even this Pacifica mammoth that was a result of like just rain, right? Like the rainy season, it it just kind of washed. It, it's out. not rain. It's not rainy season. It's the not snowing and deadly cold season. It's the thawing out <laughs> season. Um, they, no, but see, I think I think they expect it. That's the point. Is the areas they go to, they 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 totally expect it. Oh, but interesting thing. So it, I believe it's at Muskaya. It was the um, you know, the place the tunnels I was in, is that they did find a couple years ago. They found a, a cave lion. That's where they found the cave lion cub. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, the misidentified cave lion cub. It, it ended up being like an ice age lynx. Oh really? <laughs> so yeah, oh, somebody, really? I didn't know that. Somebody, okay. somebody jumped the gun with a description. <laughs> oh, whoops. Well, nonetheless, it's still really cool. I mean, I, we don't have, you know, do we have more preserved lynxes? I, I don't think so. But that's the point, is it was found at that site. And it, it, so I'm not trying to say that Muskaya is a unique site. It's just the one that we went to. And uh, no doubt there's dozens or hundreds of these, these sort of deposits but the only people that know where they are really are the locals. And, of course, the locals are not going to welcome outsiders. And, of course, you have to have a permit and all these other things anyway. And, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it was good times, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, that's it for me, Arson. Yeah, I've got the last question, after which we'll probably wrap up the session. But in any case, uh, let's get into it. So, uh, what was the Colombian mammoth's role in the Pleistocene ecology of North America? That's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, what kind of niche partitioning, if any, would we have seen between the Colombian mammoth and the American mastodon? Thank you very much. Ah, okay, good question. Um, well, uh, the Colombian mammoth, you know, you can see is the niche is large herbivore. You know, large herbivore, and it's not so large or eating so much that it's chasing out the other herbivores. You know, and and because you, you know, so we see these assemblages where you'll see uh, like Camelops histernus next to a Colombian mammoth, where you can imagine, as we see megafauna today, where you, you could see easily a Colombian mammoth, a small family of Colombian mammoths there, with some Camelops just kind of nearby ignoring one another you know grazing and just chilling out and i don't know maybe having a little bit more comfort and safety in numbers um and that's really its niche is you, you but the other the second part the uh, second question um i think based on morphology a difference between a colombian mammoth and a mastodon they don't 
my suspicion is they're not competing. They're not they're not in competition with one another. And it's based on morphology is that the mammoths are grazers, you know, like cattle. They got their their heads down, so to speak, or their trunks down. And they're they're getting a lot of grasses, a lot of things like that. And there's even, you know, some evidence that the the um, the the uh, tusks themselves are being used sometimes as almost like a clearing device because you can see abrasions on the underside of the tusks of uh, and, and you can see uh, silica build up which is coming from grasses that they're somehow using it to maybe i don't know move bushes out of the way so they can get to the grass mastodons though if you look at them they don't have curved tusks that their tusks point forward that would not work at all that is those are very different tools than what the mammoth has that these tools are not for clearing stuff away instead they're more like more likely to be browsers that is to say they're going after shrubs and bushes and things like that where if the tusks are facing forward they can poke into the bush as opposed to if they're curved up you're pushing the bush out of the way so to speak before you can reach it so it's it's as if its tusks can be there to sort of gouge in and then they can just eat and, and again, you can't have Mastodon tusks, the shape that they are, and really be an effective grazer with your head down because they kind of point forward. So it, it's likely that mammoths and Mastodons were never in competition because one is, one, is, one is eating what's on the ground, so to speak, and one is eating what's a little bit higher up. It's eating, you know, shrubs and low trees and bushes and things like that. Um, I don't know if... That has been verified by looking at any kind of uh, coprolites or you know fossil poop or even just old poop. If we can see that the mastodon droppings are different than mammoth, well, um, feel but, free to tag me uh, in anytime, Tim. <laughs> and tag in, Josh. <laughs> so I mean, what we're looking at with uh, mastodons and mammoths, um, the key differences that we're seeing in their what what ecological niches they're having in terms of what they eat. Uh, it's actually very evident in the dentiary. So if you look at mammoth teeth, and you look at mastodon oh, teeth, right, right, they got they got two very yeah. Tim, Tim, I saw the light bulb on Tim. Oh going. yeah, I forgot about that <laughs> mastodon. Oh, I remember why it's called that. <laughs> so the teeth on a mastodon are very different than the teeth on a mammoth. The teeth on a mammoth are, uh, as Tim pointed out, uh, grazing. They, they were plains animals. They were, they were breaking down tougher plant material in terms of grasses, uh, certain foliage and trees. Mastodon teeth have these huge cusps, uh, these very pointed teeth. And you see this with animals that actually feed on softer foliage. Um, an example in terms of an animal that's not related, but it has similar teeth, are uh, brontotheres or titanotheres. They actually have the same sharp cusps on their molars. And the reason why this is is because these animals were feeding on soft plant t uh, tissue like ferns, um, uh, very unique, almost like what you see in the uh, evergreen forests in Bella Coola. So you got to remember in the Ice Age, all the climates kind of dropped down a decibel. So what we see today in California, Southern California, Back in the Ice Age, it would actually be uh, Santa Barbara. It would actually be more of the mid mid California and Midwestern climate drop down to that area. But we would see in in Midwestern California, Northern California, we would actually see in places like Canada and Bella Coola, uh, which is where we have a lot of these like evergreen forests uh, in those areas. So everything gets shifted down because of the glaciers and the and the giant glacial shelf. So that's what's dictating the uh, the diet for these animals. The mammoths were specializing in in grazing and plains grazing and breaking down tougher plant material. Uh, this could be a reason why we're finding animals like woolly mammoth up in Siberia and not animals that are more dependent on soft plant tissue because these plants aren't going to grow in these harsh conditions. But you can get grasses and other shrubbery fairly easily, and mammoths are specialized to feed on that. Versus um, mastodons, you, you get a whole different world. You, you got to have a certain plant to have mastodons thrive, because mastodons 
were built to feed on very specific plant materials. So now that's that's kind of more or less the 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 rhyme and reason between why they were eating, what they were eating, why they rarely came into contact with each other in terms of food. Not to say they didn't fight, because as we see with elephants in general, they can get angry. <laughs> um, just just studying African bull elephants or elephants in general, uh, they will chase you down. They will chase away anything they perceive as a threat, including other elephants. Um, but yeah, that's that's roughly the touch and go in terms of of ecological niches with mastodons and mammoth. Yeah, to add to add something about the teeth too is that you see this with mammoth teeth. Um, the, the the idea of eating grasses and things like that is is especially most grasses have silica in them. Um, it's actually a way almost a, a way to fight back against herbivores is make them a little bit more difficult to eat because they've got all this like you know actually little crystals of silica in them, and. Uh, the mammoth teeth are really ideal for grinding the hell out of that stuff and processing it. But as a byproduct, you get a silica polish. You actually get sort of a layer of silica. And so when you have mammoth teeth that are not fossilized, they have this incredible shine to them that isn't simply because of wear and use. It's also because there is actually a nice layer of silica on the grinding surfaces and in the, the, the little cupules um, from eating grasses. And to my knowledge, you don't see that same kind of thing in mastodons. I mean, they, again, they're, they're, their teeth are much more for mashing up leaf matter and things like that. Cool beans. <laughs> well, uh, that's really interesting. Uh, I'm just like, uh, you know, bl blown away by this, you know, like uh, back, back and forth. Like, oh, yeah, by the way, this. Oh, yeah, I just remembered that, you know. And this, <laughs> it's really oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah, I love that. Uh, it's uh, well. That's what happens when you bring two mammoth uh, specialists on the show. I guess it would be would be expected. But in any case, we are we have reached the conclusion of our session, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Doctor Tim King for joining us and uh, sharing his experience and inputs and his knowledge. Thank you very much. Hey, Tim. thank you, and thank you for having me. It's a real honor. And I hope we will hopefully and uh, we'll see how the viewers as well respond. But I think they will be more than happy because I have a lot of mammoth lovers on this channel <laughs> and uh, they will probably be begging for Tim to come back again at some point. Uh, so, I mean, they did want Josh to come back. So now Josh is like pretty much nonstop on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and uh, I wanted to say also thank you to Joshua Volse for uh, once again helping me out and helping to arrange this uh, amazing session and uh, make it happen. And also helping me out to sort of, you know, because I was really busy after I came back from holiday, things were being really hectic and crazy and uh, he really took it on himself to arrange, you know, the structure of the program and uh, I kind of had to almost go into the last minute and review it and be like, Okay, I think we're happy, and it actually turned out very well. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> You're welcome, guys. And uh, yeah, me and you, Tim, we got to find another mammoth soon. <laughs> oh man, I don't know. Can we, can we, we let's find something else, man. Megatherium. I'd, I'd kill. Can we just go to Megatherium? We'll do Megatherium. You know what? We did find ground sloth. We did find. Yeah. So Meg anyway. Meg <laughs> All right, you guys. Megatherium. Thanks sounds again. Good. Yeah. No worries, no worries. So in any case, now uh, I will just conclude the session on my behalf as well. I want to say uh, those of you who are new to the channel, uh, please uh, make sure you hit that like button and absolutely smash it as hard as you can. And uh, also subscribe. And uh, I would like to say that I am grateful to all of you for supporting the channel. And uh, I love you all to bits. And thanks for watching. I've been AK Rex, and now it's time to go. Goodbye until next time. Bye.